every Smash stage. Every stage in Super Smash Bros. has a ton of love poured into it, referencing dozens of video games across history down to the smallest details. And as the reference guy, I've been asked for this I don't know how many times. I've always just put it off because it's a big task, but it's also not so big that it would take me years to do it. And I'm finally caving. We're gonna tackle this game by game. For the most part, I'm gonna focus on just the first version of a stage, how it appeared in its debut game. There will be some exceptions where we talk about upgrades or changes in future appearances, but for the most part, we're going to stick to the first appearance. Okay, enough stalling, here we go. Every single stage in Super Smash Bros. So the first ever stage we'll be talking about is none other than Peach's Castle. This stage is a bit of an oddball. Smash presents the stage as the top of Peach's Castle from Super Mario 64, with a matching tower in the center and the background of the stage being an aerial shot of the castle as a whole. However, there are also plenty of elements that are just kind of thrown together from other levels in the game. The main platform's floor is taken from the lobby of the castle, the bridges from Cool Cool Mountain, and even these Lego blocks from Bowser in the Dark World. The stage also has a bumper hovering left to right as a hazard, though this doesn't really have any basis for Mario 64. Exclusively in Smash 64, a Lakitu will also occasionally fly by, representing the Lakitu who controls the camera in Mario 64. But in all later versions of this stage, this Lakitu is missing. Next up is Donkey Kong's home turf, Congo Jungle, spelled with a C in Smash 64, but changing to being spelled with a K in all future games. Congo Jungle is a stage inspired by the aesthetic of Donkey Kong Country, the soft reboot of the Donkey Kong franchise. As a whole, the stage's elements are taken from the appearance of levels found in Congo Jungle, the first world of the first Donkey Kong Country game, with wooden buildings and platforms being a staple for the levels. The sunset environment for the stage is taken from Orangutan Gang, where this same sunset gradient is used in the background. Congo Jungle also has a barrel with an arrow moving underneath it. Barrels are another staple in Donkey Kong Country with many uses, one of which being to blast the Kongs forward in the direction it's currently facing. This barrel functions similarly by moving side to side and also occasionally rotating. If the player is too low to recover on the stage, they can aim for the barrel and get blasted to the stage by either pressing a button or waiting out the timer. Arrow barrels originate from Donkey Kong Country 2, however these ironically don't move in their home game. The barrel in Smash likely contains the arrow just to make it easier to determine which direction the barrel is facing. Next, we have the first ever Zelda series stage, Hyrule Castle. This stage is a well-done adaptation of the highest section of Hyrule Castle from Ocarina of Time, which is also the game Link in Smash 64 is based on. The only changes made to this section is giving the middle tower platforms to walk on and raising the far right spire to make it playable. The background for the stage features Death Mountain, a looming volcano that can be seen from nearly everywhere while out in Hyrule. So thematically this works well for the stage, since you would also be able to see Death Mountain in Ocarina of Time. Hyrule Castle also has occasional tornadoes that appear as hazards that spin players caught in them and launch them upward. While this exact function doesn't take place in Zelda games of the era, the recorder in The Legend of Zelda has the ability to summon a tornado and teleport Link to different dungeons, which could possibly be where this is derived from. Our next stage is Planet Zebes from the Metroid series. Planet Zebes is a sort of destroyed cave-style stage, with the notable attribute of having acid as a hazard that regularly rises and falls, forcing the players to change where they fight. Zebes is the planet that both Metroid and Super Metroid take place on, though the stage itself isn't exactly a direct connection to anything specific. Elements of the stage are pulled from Metroid, however. The platform's design is borrowed from some of the tiles found in Norfair. The acid itself is taken from the appearance of acid in Metroid while the concept of rising acid is taken from Super Metroid, where lava would rise in certain areas of the game. In the background of the stage, you will occasionally see Ridley, pretty much the most popular boss in all of Metroid, and some Wavers, another more common type of enemy. At the bottom of the stage, we can see what appears to be a map, which is likely based on the layout of rooms and hallways found in the Metroid series. This is one of the few stages that has never returned in any capacity in any Smash game, making it a Smash 64 exclusive that was since replaced by a similar stage that we'll talk about in a bit. Next up, we have the only unlockable stage in Smash 64, Mushroom Kingdom. This stage gets its design from Super Mario Bros., with some bits translated into 3D. The foreground features some platforms, POW blocks, bricks, and pipes. The pipes also have piranha plants that occasionally rise out of them, taken straight from the game. 
You can crouch on these pipes and they will actually allow you to use them to warp. Though rather than take you to a new area, it will simply send you to a random pipe elsewhere on the stage. This stage also has the balance lifts, which are not only fully functional, but actually take a character's weight into consideration. Heavy characters make these fall quicker than lighter characters, and if two characters are on each end, the scale will adjust accordingly. This also means that if characters are equal weight, the power lift will be completely balanced. The POW block isn't actually from Super Mario Bros., but rather the arcade Mario Bros., probably just added to throw in some chaos to the stage. In the background, you can see some bullet bills, buzzy beetles, clouds, and mushrooms to all match up with the aesthetic of Super Mario Bros. But you may notice that the 64 version of this stage kinda feels almost like knockoff Mario Bros. in some areas, particularly in the colors of sprites and their proportions to one another. All of this changed in Mushroom Kingdom's only return from 64 in Smash Ultimate. This time around, the stage looks far more uniform size-wise, and moreover, it looks like they straight up ripped the sprites from Super Mario Bros. rather than recreating everything. So color-wise, it looks closer too. Functionally, however, this stage is essentially the same, with minor background elements really being the only changes. For Mario, we next move to Yoshi and his stage. Yoshi's Island, as it's named in Smash 64 and Melee, and Super Happy Tree, as it's named in Ultimate. This is naturally Yoshi's home stage in 64, and it has a very arts and crafts type feel to it, which makes sense when we look at its inspiration, Yoshi's story. In this game, the Super Happy Tree is the source of all happiness for the Yoshis, and Baby Bowser steals the Super Happy Tree and turns Yoshi's Island into a picture book. So the Super Happy Tree is in the background of the stage, with the actual stage design being sort of original for Smash. However, aesthetically, it gets its cardboard appearance from the first level of the game, and its more fabric appearance from the second and third levels. There are also clouds that appear over the abyss on the left and right of the stage, and will despawn after a certain amount of time after a player has landed on them. The 64 version of the stage also features message blocks taken from Yoshi's story, though these are in the background of the stage above the clouds and serve no function in Smash. Next up, we have honestly one of my favorite stages in all of Smash, Dreamland from the Kirby series. This colorful stage is inspired by Green Greens, originally from Kirby's Dreamland, but more based on the appearance from Kirby Superstar. The stage also prominently features Wispy Woods, a giant tree with a face who serves as the first boss of the previously mentioned games. Though he has other attacks in his home game, on this stage he simply blows wind either left or right, pushing players in the respective direction, but dealing no damage. The background of this stage is a very low quality top-down view of Dreamland, the world from Kirby. Additionally, in the background you can occasionally see either King DDD or Bronto Burts flying across, just for a little ambiance. Our next stage is Sector Z from the Star Fox series. This stage features the Great Fox, Team Star Fox's mothership, traveling through space with debris and missiles flying by on the screen. Occasionally, our wings will fly by during gameplay and fire lasers at players, dealing damage to them. Sector Z is an area of the Lilat system in Star Fox 64, appropriately named because of the Z shape in the area. During the course of Star Fox 64, Team Star Fox heads to Sector Z based on a lead, but gets ambushed, with the Great Fox being threatened by Copperhead missiles. The stage in Smash is a recreation of this level, complete with the background of the stage even being an image of Sector Z from the game. This is yet another stage that did not return in any future Smash games, again being spiritually replaced by another stage with similar inspiration. The final accessible multiplayer stage is none other than Saffron City, repping the Pokemon Fighters. This stage sees the players fight atop rooftops of skyscrapers found in Saffron City, the biggest city in Pokemon Red and Blue versions. The main building is Silphco, the site of Team Rocket's takeover at the climax of the game. During the course of battle, the doors on the Silphco building will open up, and a random Pokemon can appear, with a variety of effects. First is Venusaur, who can use Razor Leaf to damage players. Next is Charmander, who can blast out Flamethrower to damage players. Then we have Electrode, who will roll out of the doors, chill for a moment, and then use Explosion, causing massive damage and knockback. Next, Porygon, who simply blasts out at a high speed as a sort of surprise attack. Lastly is Chansey, who instead is a helpful Pokemon. She will spawn an egg that contains an item inside, and additionally, she will instead heal players on contact, unlike every other Pokemon on this list, which all deal damage on contact. There are also occasionally Pokemon that fly by in the background, though they all serve no function as a hazard. These Pokemon are Butterfree, Pidgey, Fearow, and rarest of all, the legendary bird Moltres. 
Now, despite covering all of the accessible multiplayer stages, there are three stages in Smash 64 that for all intents and purposes should be multiplayer stages. They're all just locked behind single player modes. So we'll break some rules and we'll briefly talk about these. First, we have what is officially named Dual Zone in Smash 64, but would later become the standard layout for the stage known as Battlefield. This is an original stage to Smash, and in Smash 64, serves as a location for battles against the Fighting Polygon team in the game's one-player mode, and it does fit the style of the Fighting Polygons pretty well. This stage would go on to have a counterpart in every single other Smash game, though this design has never been reused. Instead, the tri-platform and general stage construction has all been the same, with different designs in every entry. The other stage that doesn't exist in 64's multiplayer, but does in future Smash games, is Final Destination. Once again, this is a Smash original design, a completely flat stage. This stage was originally designed as the perfect stage to fight Master Hand, the boss of 64's one-player game, as there are no walls or platforms to aid in avoiding all of his attacks. Final Destination also received versions in all future Smash titles that were actually playable in multiplayer, again, each with their own designs. And the final pseudo-multiplayer stage in Smash 64 is Metacrystal. Metacrystal is kind of a mixture of Smash Original and also inspired by Super Mario 64. This stage was created to better fit the fight against Metal Mario in one player game, with the inspiration coming from the Cavern of the Metal Cap from Mario 64. In that game, Metal Mario is simply a power-up that Mario can obtain for a short while. While Smash really was the first game to consider this a fully separate entity from standard Mario. The Cavern of the Metal Cap has all kinds of crystals all over the place leading up to the Metal Cap switch, and this stage in Smash has crystals all over the stage as well as the background image. Aside from this connection, however, the stage is pretty much an original design for Smash. Unfortunately, this stage has never graduated to full multiplayer stage in any future Smash title, but it felt wrong to leave it out because it does really seem like a multiplayer stage. As a result, this is the only single-player stage that we'll actually talk about in this video. Next, it's time to move on to Melee, which has way more stages to talk about. So let's start with Princess Peach's Castle. This stage served as a sort of upgrade of the Peach's Castle stage from Smash 64, being a more faithful representation of the outside of the castle from Mario 64. However, it isn't without its liberties. First, texture-wise, the stage looks rather different. The colors are now a bit more muted. The spire in the center of the stage is also scaled down, and the top of the tower has been fully removed, making it more reasonable to traverse the stage. Over the course of the match, multiple switches spawn, and when hit, blocks matching the color will appear. This concept has appeared in both Super Mario World and Super Mario 64, so this is sort of a fusion of those two ideas, though the blocks themselves are missing the expected exclamation marks. Just like in those games, items will appear from these blocks, however, instead of being specific items designated for each color, random items will appear. If item spawns are set to none, these blocks still appear, but they simply serve as additional platforms. Bonsai Bills will also spawn during this match, and will slowly move towards the castle before making contact and causing a huge explosion. Bonsai Bills first appeared in Super Mario World as well, though at the time they never caused a giant explosion, making that aspect a Smash original for the time. The next Mario Universe stage in Melee is Rainbow Cruise. This stage is an auto-scroller that starts out on a flying pirate ship before moving to a variety of blocks found in the Mario series and ultimately looping back around to the pirate ship again. Most of these elements are pulled from Rainbow Ride, one of the final worlds of Super Mario 64. However, much has been adjusted in order to serve as a better stage in Smash. For instance, the pirate ship does exist in Rainbow Ride, but it looks drastically different and it never actually moves. Instead, Mario rides around in this world on magic carpets that follow Rainbow Pass, which are used later on in other parts of the stage. The overall layout is also largely original, though as I said, the elements used throughout do exist in Super Mario 64. Additionally, seeing mountains in the background is fully Smash original, as nothing like this exists in Mario 64. You can also see a little small village sitting on one of these mountains, which again doesn't exist in the game of Origin. Now let's talk Mushroom Kingdom. While this shares the name with the Smash 64 stage, it's a completely new version of a similar concept, once again based on the original Super Mario Bros. aesthetic. Again, we have brick blocks, though this time they can actually be broken by attacking or jumping into them. Question mark blocks also spawn, and with items enabled, will result in a random item appearing out of them when they're hit. This stage also has balance lifts, just like Mushroom Kingdom 64, and they function in precisely the same way. Unlike the previous version of this stage, this one unfortunately does not have functional warp pipes. 
And as an easter egg, if you angle the camera past the typical boundary, you can see a danger sign, which is a fun nod to that area serving as the blast zones for the stage. And next, we have Mushroom Kingdom 2. Ironically, despite the name, this stage doesn't originate from any location found canonically in the Mushroom Kingdom. Instead, it's based on the Land of Dreams, or Subcon, the setting of Super Mario Bros. 2 or Super Mario USA. They probably just rolled with Mushroom Kingdom 2 as a name to indicate that it's a Mario stage, especially since at the time, virtually no one knew the name of Mario 2's setting. The elements found in the stage come from the overworld segments of Mario 2, particularly from World 1-1. Basically, the stage is based on the remake of Super Mario Bros. 2 found in Super Mario All-Stars, rather than from the original for the NES. The center features a waterfall that has falling logs, which can serve as platforms, pulled directly from such a segment in World 1-1. Additionally, two enemies spawn on the stage. The first is Pidget, a small bird on a magic carpet. While this is normally a defeatable enemy in the original game, and the carpet becomes controllable, in Smash, Pidget instead shows up occasionally and can be used as a platform. The other enemy that spawns is Birdo, who will walk in from the edges on either the left or right side, and she fires eggs towards the players that can hit them and deal damage. Birdo is a recurring boss in Super Mario Bros. 2, and their main source of damage is firing rounds of eggs at the player as well. Our next stage in Melee is Congo Jungle, not to be confused with that one. This one spells Congo with a K. To avoid confusion though, this stage's return in Smash Ultimate renames this to Congo Falls. This stage takes place on the edge of a waterfall, with platforms built on top of rocks jutting out the side. Despite sharing the name with Donkey Kong Country's first world, this stage isn't pulled from any specific part of these games, though certain elements are pulled from the trilogy. The log platform secured with rope is a general design used throughout the Donkey Kong Country games. In the background, we can see Donkey Kong's treehouse, which notably appears on the Congo Jungle world map, as well as in the first level of Donkey Kong Country, though it doesn't exist anywhere near a waterfall like it does in this stage. Claptrap enemies, which first appeared in Donkey Kong Country, occasionally fall over the edge of the waterfall, and if a player happens to be there, they can deal massive damage and knockback. The bottom also has yet another barrel cannon that moves back and forth, and similar to the Smash 64 stage, can catch a player and blast them in the direction that the arrow is pointing. The other newly introduced Donkey Kong stage for Melee is Jungle Japes. This stage takes place above a river, with the main platform in the center and two smaller platforms on either side of it. In both the later appearances of this stage in Brawl and Ultimate, it's possible to swim in the river, making it possible to jump out of the water and back onto the platforms. In Melee and Smash for 3DS, swimming is not possible, and you essentially sink like a rock if you aren't careful. This stage once again is a mishmash of elements from the Donkey Kong Country series. Log platforms above water, the barrel house to the left, and the palm trees in the background can all be found throughout the Donkey Kong Country games. Claptrap enemies can also hop up out of the water, and just like in the previous stage, can deal massive damage to players hit by them. The center platform also features Cranky's cabin in the background, naturally where Cranky Kong lives throughout the Donkey Kong series. However, while this cabin first appeared in the Country series, its appearance in Smash is based on the most recent appearance at the time of Melee's release, its appearance from Donkey Kong 64. In this game, Cranky Kong is a scientist that offers all of the Kongs various ability upgrades. You can see Cranky's silhouette in this cabin, and you can also see the various test tubes and glassware that he uses as well. The name for this stage is also more based on Donkey Kong 64 than the country games, with Jungle Japes literally being the name of the first world in Donkey Kong 64. Up next, we have Great Bay. This Zelda stage is inspired by the Great Bay region in Termina, the setting of The Legend of Zelda Majora's Mask. On the stage, we have two man-made platforms, along with a rock structure on the left, and occasionally a giant turtle on the right. The two center platforms are essentially pulled straight from Majora's Mask. However, they've been oriented to the right instead, allowing for an extra platform to fight on. If they were kept as they are in Majora's Mask, the bottom platform would be behind the main platform, inaccessible to fighters. The building on this main platform is the Marine Research Laboratory, a location that Link visits several times during his adventure in Termina. On the lower platform, there's also an Owl statue, which in Majora's Mask functionally serve as warp points that are scattered all over the map. One of these does exist on this platform in the original game, however in Smash it has again been oriented slightly differently in order to face the player. The giant turtle that appears is also a key plot point in Majora's Mask, allowing Link to travel to the Great Bay Temple, though it never really appears in this exact area in the game. Additionally, another friend appears on this stage, Tingle. Tingle was first introduced in Majora's Mask, but has since become a regular staple in the Zelda series. Tingle can blow up his balloon and float in the air, acting as a mid-air platform. However, if a hitbox hits the balloon, it will pop, and Tingle will come plummeting down. 
This comes straight from Majora's Mask, where Link needs to fire a projectile at Tingle's balloon in order to get him to the ground, where Link can then speak to him and purchase maps from him. Finally, the background effectively plays out the big danger in Majora's Mask. As the match goes on, the moon will get closer and closer to the Earth, until it looks like it's about to hit. Then, the four giants, each freed by Link by conquering their respective temples, will appear to halt the moon before throwing it back up into the sky, where this cycle repeats. This plays on a three minute loop during the course of the match, which is a reference to the three day time cycle that serves as the core mechanic in Majora's Mask. The other brand new Zelda stage introduced in Melee is one of the most well known in perhaps the entire Smash series, Temple. This is a huge stage with multiple levels, platforms, and the Pit of Doom down at the bottom. The general atmosphere of this stage is loosely based on the appearance of temples in Zelda 2, The Adventure of Link for the NES, and both the actual temple appearance as well as their design in the overworld. However, the stage layout itself is completely original to Smash, not particularly based on the appearance of any area found in Zelda 2. Moving on, we have the first new Metroid stage introduced in Melee, Brinstar. If you did a double take thinking this stage was already covered, I really wouldn't blame you. Brinstar is a sort of reworked evolution of the Smash 64 stage, Planet Zebus. Same overall theme, same rising and falling acid that hurts you, just on a much smaller scale. Brinstar is the very first location you begin the original Metroid in, and the second location you visit in Super Metroid. While the elements of this stage are borrowed from these two games, the overall look and design of the stage is mostly unique to Smash. Many of the references are the same as for the Planet Zebus stage, since Brinstar is a location found on that planet. In the middle of the main platform, in the background, we can see a Chozo statue. These are found throughout the Metroid series, usually holding on to an item upgrade. Occasionally another variant, called Torizos, are capable of walking around and attacking Samus. This Chozo statue is capable of walking around in Smash, however it simply will walk around a bit before sitting back down, with no effect on gameplay whatsoever. There's also a large clump of round, organic things on the bottom of the main platform, and when attacked, these will be destroyed and cause the stage to partially separate. Similarly, the two side platforms are both attached by some kind of fleshy growth, and can also take several hits before breaking and causing these platforms to shift at an angle. Both of these could be nods to the nature of Metroid games, where you destroy blocks or parts of the environment in order to change aspects of a room or open up access to a new area. The other Metroid stage is also a Brinstar one, Brinstar Depths. This is an all new stage, unlike the previous one, and it's pretty wild. It starts on a large floating island of sorts with other platforms nearby, pretty unevenly designed. You'll also notice the giant monster in the background. That's Kraid, a mini boss that first appeared in Metroid before getting promoted to full boss in Super Metroid. Regularly throughout the match, Kraid will rotate the stage, causing players to prioritize getting to safety or being risky and going for cheeky kills. This rotation of the stage is a completely Smash original design, as is pretty much everything going on with this stage, as it bears no resemblance to Kraid's lair in either Metroid or Super Metroid. This stage being named Brinstar Depths is simply observational, with Kraid's lair literally being deep within Brinstar. In the jump from Melee to Ultimate, Kraid gets a much more refined and polished model. Outside of this though, the stage is pretty much entirely the same, just prettier and in true HD. Time for another stage that reuses a previously used name, Yoshi's Island. This time around, the Yoshi's Island stage is built off of the appearance of Yoshi's Island as it appears in the first world of Super Mario World. The general aesthetic of the foreground and background, the big hills, all of this is peak Super Mario World. In particular, the diagonal pipes are also taken straight from the first level of the game. In the center, we have rotating blocks, which were first introduced in Super Mario World. In that game, if you jump into them or spin them with a cape, they start to rotate, making it possible to pass through them. Likewise, the same is true for Smash, making that center pit potentially dangerous if you aren't careful. Occasionally, a fish in Lakitu carrying a 1-up mushroom and a bonsai bill will fly by in the background, both enemies that debuted in Super Mario World. The other Yoshi stage introduced in Melee is Yoshi's Story, of course named after the N64 game. Like the Super Happy Tree stage from Smash 64, this stage also has the paper, cardboard, and fabric aesthetics taken from the storybook design found in Yoshi's Story. Flying Shy Guys are a stage hazard on this stage, capable of being hit by player attacks. 
If items are on, they will carry food and drop it when attacked. Otherwise, they'll carry nothing, but still serve as a hazard for the stage. On the sides of the stage are dashed lines that serve as a track for a happy little cloud, given the nickname Randall in the Smash community. This cloud moves along this track throughout the entirety of the match, making it possible for players to land on it rather than go for the ledge or the stage. This cloud is taken from the level Rail Lift in Yoshi's Story, which features Yoshi riding this same cloud along a series of rails to progress through the level. Finally, in the background we can see Pack e Derm, a weird half-elephant, half-egg looking guy, walking back and forth on the stage holding a stop sign. Pack e Derm gets in the way of Yoshi during Yoshi's Story, requiring a ground pound to progress. However, here in Smash, he just walks back and forth as a silly little guy. Next, let's move on to the Fountain of Dreams. This stage is originally based on the Fountain of Dreams found in Kirby's Adventure and Kirby Superstar, a fountain found on Planet Popstar that supplies good dreams to those living in Dreamland. However, the developers seem to have taken an opportunity with the Smash stage to redesign how this fountain looks, as it looks quite different from its original appearances. Nevertheless, the core concept of a fountain remains, and the majority of the main stage section is covered in water. Additionally, there are three platforms, with the left and right ones rising and lowering depending on the stream of water beneath them. This redesign of Fountain of Dreams actually extends into the main Kirby series, with this being the basis for how the fountain looks in games made after Melee's release. It's always kind of neat when Smash influences future games based on its representation of their series. The other new Kirby stage introduced in Melee is Green Greens. This stage features three chunks of land, each connected by various yellow star or sometimes bomb blocks, which have both appeared in Kirby games. Prominently in the center of the stage, of course, is Wispy Woods, who has uprooted his life from Dreamland in order to come to this stage instead. Like on Dreamland, Wispy will occasionally blow wind either left or right, causing players to move. Unlike on Dreamland, Wispy will also shake occasionally and drop apples, which can either be eaten to heal up some damage or be thrown as a projectile. Both of these are Wispy's main means of attack in the Kirby games. Very basic, considering he's typically the first boss of each game. Green Greens is the first level of Kirby's Dreamland for the Game Boy. However, this stage instead takes its design cues from the first stage of Popstar in Kirby 64 The Crystal Shards, sort of a fusion of these two first levels. We have yet another spiritual successor to a Smash 64 stage up next, Corneria from the Star Fox series. This is probably the closest that a successor has been to its previous counterpart, with the fight still taking place on the Great Fox. This time though, the Great Fox is scaled down in size so that the characters are proportionally bigger to the ship compared to Smash 64, and the blast zones are more reasonably closer to the stage. Arwing will still occasionally fly down and fire double lasers, joined now by Wolfen, also firing lasers on the Great Fox. The front cannons can act as a platform for players to stand on, but they also fire two massive lasers occasionally that almost always KO. The biggest change is of course the background, with it now being, as indicated by the name, the level Corneria, a recurring location in the Star Fox series. This specific version is based on the first level from Star Fox 64, Corneria, and it follows the same path that Team Star Fox does during the events of the game. This stage appeared in both Brawl and Smash for 3DS relatively unchanged. However, in Ultimate, the appearance has had a big overhaul. In this version, it is now based on Corneria as it appears in Star Fox Zero, the latest entry in the series for the Wii U that serves as a reimagining of the events of Star Fox 64. Next, we turn things 90 degrees and move on to Venom. This stage also features the Great Fox, however, instead of facing to the left, it now faces directly at the viewer, drastically decreasing the amount of surface that players have to utilize. As the name suggests, this stage is a recreation of the level Venom, the final level of Star Fox 64. In Star Fox, Venom is a sort of barren wasteland. However, in Smash, they've instead gone ahead and interpreted this to also have a ton of volcanic craters and lava everywhere. There are also plenty of rock formations and a giant cave the Great Fox traverses through. Ironically though, the Great Fox is never seen in this level in Star Fox, as Team Star Fox pilots their R-Wings instead. This stage does have R-Wings and Wolfens appear though, and just like on Corneria, they will fire lasers down on the players. Next, let's make our way to Kanto and talk about Pokemon Stadium. This stadium is clearly meant to be used for Pokemon battles, but Smash has completely co-opted it for its silly little party game. In the background, we can see a big Jumbotron, which will show a variety of things. Footage of characters fighting, the current player rankings, the timer, and the upcoming form the stage will take, because this stage is also a transforming stage. There are four different forms aside from its standard layout that this stage can take on. The Jumbotron will indicate a typing symbol, and the transformation will rise out of the bottom. These transformations are a grass form with wooden platforms in the center, a tree with a branch that serves as a platform, and some forestry elements in the background. 
a fire form, which features basically the aftermath of a forest fire, with dying trees and a half-burnt-down house. A water form, which features a small pool of water, some fountains holding up platforms, and a big windmill that can be walked on. And a rock form, which summons terrain that represents a small canyon with a mineshaft with platforms in the middle. While it's definitely possible that the base form of this stage is inspired by the stadiums that were found in the game of the same name, Pokemon Stadium, the battlefield transformation aspect is never seen in any core Pokemon games. However, it was a big detail used during the first season of the Pokemon anime when Ash was competing in the Indigo Plateau Conference. The preliminary rounds of this conference had the trainers competing on four different battlefield types, rock, grass, water, and ice. While the actual designs used in Smash are pretty much original, there's no doubt that this detail in the anime would have inspired the creation of this stage. The other Pokemon stage introduced in Melee is the ever-popular Pokefloats. This is a stage that, as the game indicates, takes place above the Kanto skies. These giant Pokemon floats serve as the ground fighters can walk and fight on, and they will float in and out of the frame in the playable area. The Pokemon featured in this stage are, in order of appearance, Squirtle, Onix, Psyduck, Chikorita, Weezing, Slowpoke, Porygon, Wooper, Pseudowoodo, Snorlax, Venusaur, Seal, Wobbuffet, Unknown, Goldeen, Lickitung, Chansey, and Geodude. All of the models found on this stage are ripped straight from the Pokemon Stadium and 64 games. Honestly, this stage must have been some kind of drug-induced fever dream that they decided to make real, because there is zero source material for any of this. The current theory is that Sprout Tower, a stage originally planned for Melee, got scrapped late in development, and this fever dream of a stage was thrown together in order to give the Pokemon series a second stage. However, this has never been confirmed or disproven. This is, unfortunately, another stage that has never seen a return beyond its debut game, leaving it behind in Melee. Next, we have the first ever F-Zero stage in Smash history, Mute City. This stage is a pretty faithful recreation of Mute City 1 from F-Zero X for the Nintendo 64. The fight moves on a platform throughout the raceway, moving to different points along the track before pausing at various sections. These sections have you fight directly on the raceway, occasionally with new platforms that are raised up. When the platform is about to raise and move away again, a Go icon appears at the top, accompanied by a sound effect. This same sound effect plays when a racer crosses the finish line in a race. Throughout the fight, vehicles are regularly speeding by, potentially hitting any fighters or being hit by fighters. Ultimately, the stage is pretty faithful to the original track outside of the platforms that spawn in. The only exception I can see is the energy panels known as pits, which in F-Zero refill a vehicle's energy, but in Smash, basically just act like ice physics, making it a slippery area for the players to run on. This is yet another stage that has never seen a return in any future Smash game. Our other F-Zero stage is Big Blue, naturally also based on a raceway from the F-Zero series. This one in particular pulls inspiration from both forms of Big Blue found on the standard version of F-Zero X for the N64. As opposed to Mute City, Big Blue features a race with F-Zero vehicles, but from the side perspective, with the vehicles serving as potential platforms as well. The main part of the stage is Captain Falcon's ship, the Falcon Flyer, considerably bigger than the standard vehicles. The Falcon Flyer's only appearance in the F-Zero series doesn't even take place in the games. Instead, it appears in the manual for the original F-Zero, so Sakurai was really using the deep cuts for this stage. The stage itself doesn't actually follow the path of an actual track like Mute City did. Instead, this is a randomly generated track. Many parts of the big blue stages in F-Zero X are completely missing from Smash, and other parts have been added that weren't present in the first place. Overall, it mostly just seems to use the theming Big Blue has while doing its own Smash original thing. In both Melee and Brawl, the vehicles are based on their designs from F-Zero X for the N64. However, in the upgrade it got in Ultimate, the cars were updated to instead be based on the vehicles designed from F-Zero GX, the sequel that was made for the GameCube. Now let's move on to O-Net, the hometown of Ness. This stage is made up of three buildings, a yellow with a red roof, a light blue with a darker roof, and the brick drugstore in the center. The blue house bears resemblance to houses found in Earthbound, while the drugstore is an actual location found in Earthbound. This store has one awning in the actual game, while in Smash it was given two and was made a bit taller, just for some variety. Likewise, the house on the left side bears no resemblance to houses in Earthbound, and was again likely changed up to just be different from the blue house. The background also shows us a bit more, aside from the generic houses. We can see the hospital, Ness and Porky's houses, 
and the meteorite at the top of a hill seen at the very start of Earthbound. This stage also features multiple cars that regularly drive recklessly past the fighters, and could potentially hit them for massive damage. First, there are two generic cars, a teal one and a magenta one. Then there's also a taxi cab, which was possibly derived from the mad taxi enemy that's found in Earthbound. And finally, we have the Runaway 5's black van, which is more directly associated with Ness and Co. during the events of the game. Off screen, you can also see other elements of Onet, such as the hotel and the arcade. More detailed, but still off screen, is the Onet message board, based on similar signs that are found around Onet in Earthbound. In Smash, this states, Caution, a black van driven by this guy has been spotted racing recklessly through town. Be careful. An image of a man accompanies the sign, with the man being Lucky, one of the Runaway 5 members. And then we have Foresight, another Earthbound series stage. Foresight places the fighters at the top of multiple skyscrapers in the city of Foresight at night, with a little bit of construction going on as well. Interestingly, if we look at Foresight from Earthbound, it really doesn't match with the Smash stage at all. The overall presentation seems to be Smash original, however both Foresight in Earthbound and in Smash share the inspiration of being based off of New York City. It's also possible that this stage was inspired by Moonside, the parallel dimension version of Foresight, which takes takes place at night with lots of neon lights everywhere. Regardless of what the inspiration was though, they elected to make this more like a real life city than anything from the games. The central building on the stage is the Monotoli building, a main location of the story of Earthbound. The building in Smash, just like the building in Earthbound, also contains a helipad that a helicopter periodically lands and flies away from. In Melee, this helicopter is rather generic, however in Ultimate, it resembles the helicopter as it is actually portrayed in Earthbound. One liberty that Smash has taken is the left building, which appears to be the Dinosaur Museum of Foresight. This is neither a skyscraper nor is it anywhere near the Monotoli building in the real game, but it does allow for some variety on the stage rather than just having another generic building. Throughout the match, a UFO will appear periodically, allowing the players to fight on it for a short time before disappearing. The surface of this UFO is almost iced or oil-like, making it very slippery. While actual UFOs are pretty rare throughout the story of Earthbound, this UFO is most likely taken from the opening cinematic ahead of the title screen, which features multiple giant UFOs attacking a town. In fact, when this UFO comes down from above, it uses the exact same sound effect as this opening cinematic. The second to last stage introduced in Melee is Icicle Mountain, the home stage of the Ice Climbers. This stage is an auto-scroller, going both up and down, requiring players to fight and be decent at platforming at the same time. This stage is clearly high atop a mountain, with lots of snow and ice on the various platforms, naturally fitting in with the theme of the Ice Climbers. Conceptually, this stage is a creative extension of the levels found in Ice Climber where the climber needs to jump up to the top of the screen in order to complete the level. There are some elements indicating ice-like terrain, such as ice blocks or polar bears. However, the limitations of the NES prevented them from designing an actual icy mountain. It was always just implied based on the game mechanics. So, Melee took the opportunity to take this to its logical conclusion and make it mountainous terrain. The polar bear is an enemy from Ice Climber. However, it's almost become a secondary mascot of sorts, appearing in every single Ice Climber stage in Smash. In the US versions of the game, there are these small Yeti-like creatures called Topis. However, in the Japanese version of the game, Topis are seal-like creatures instead. This is an extension of the localization for Ice Climber on the NES, where the seal enemy appeared in Japan, but was changed to a Yeti in North America. And the final stage in Super Smash Bros. Melee for the Nintendo GameCube is Flat Zone. This stage literally takes place inside of a Game & Watch device, with the playable area existing inside of the handheld screen. The first ever Game & Watch released in 1980 as small LCD devices that had pretty basic games, and the character Mr. Game & Watch is a conglomeration of these different games into a single character. Flat Zone squishes all characters down to be two-dimensional. They also make the same beeping noise as Mr. Game & Watch when they walk. This stage is largely based on the Game & Watch game Helmet. Layout-wise, it's quite similar, and the actual physical layout of the device is exactly the same as well, with the sole exception that Helmet on the right side is replaced by the words Smash Bros. Additionally, the stage has other elements from other games. The character from Manhole, which fills in gaps in platforms, and the character from Oil Panic spilling oil, making it a slippery surface for fighters. This stage technically doesn't make a return in this exact form, but it does have a successor that we'll talk about later. 
The first new stage in Super Smash Bros. Brawl is Delfino Plaza. Delfino Plaza is the main location of Super Mario Sunshine, serving as the hub that gives access to all of the various worlds found in the game. This stage travels all over Delfino Plaza, with the platforms lowering at various locations to briefly allow the fight to take place directly on the ground, or water, or shrine. The actual Delfino Plaza models are effectively ripped straight from Super Mario Sunshine, with textures updated to fit Brawl's style a bit, and the whole thing scaled down to improve performance. As a result, far-off areas that can be seen from Delfino Plaza are also visible in this stage. However, there are plenty of tiny changes here and there. NPCs are removed, many items found and used in the overworld are missing, some pipes are removed, the graffiti portals to other worlds are gone, and various animations are stripped. Most of this is done either because those elements are superfluous, or because it helps cut corners in certain areas to improve the performance of the stage. Next we have the Luigi's Mansion stage. This stage is a miniaturized version of the mansion that Luigi explores in the game of the same name, filled with spooky ghosties and ghoulies. When all characters are outside of the mansion interior, it will fade so that the exterior of the mansion is in view, and then it'll fade back in showing the rooms while there are characters inside. The rooms visible are all also miniaturized references of actual rooms found in the mansion, though obviously with some clear differences because they are a fraction of the size. Directly in the center, taking up both the first and second stories, we have the foyer, the main entrance into the mansion. On the left side, second story, we have the nursery, the room that belongs to Chauncey, one of the boss ghosts of the game. On the left side, ground floor, we can see the kitchen, which has the same sink, shelves, stove, and cupboard, though in the actual game it's much deeper in the mansion and you wouldn't be able to see it from the front. On the right side, second story, you'll find the study, the room that belongs to Neville. This is a drastically different location, as the study in Luigi's Mansion is on the left side, near the nursery. Lastly, on the right side, ground floor is the ballroom, another room that is quite out of place. This is where you take on the floating whirlindas. Each story of the house is held up by these four posts, which can be attacked and, when they've taken enough damage, will collapse and cause that section of the house to be completely destroyed. When this happens, a bunch of boos will appear and then vanish as if they came out of the house, which is possibly a reference to the mechanic of booze that hide inside furniture and objects in Luigi's Mansion. Our next Super Mario stage is Mushroomy Kingdom. In Brawl, this stage has two completely different forms, a 1-1 form and a 1-2 form. Both variants of this stage are 1-1 to -one creations of the first two levels of Super Mario Bros. The only exception is that there are no shortcuts available, so pipes or hidden blocks will not lead you anywhere, so you can't access bonus rooms. Both forms of this stage look totally run down, with 1-1 given a desolate desert theme and 1-2 given a sort of hidden ruins vibe. According to the Brawl Dojo website, the ancient vibe was chosen for Mushroomy Kingdom to indicate just how long it had been since Super Mario Bros. had been released, with Brawl coming out 23 years after the release of Super Mario Bros. Both forms of this stage are auto side scrollers. Additionally, they loop infinitely, so that when the flagpole or end pipe are reached, the stage naturally approaches the beginning of the level again. Like previous Super Mario series stages, hitting item blocks while items are enabled will result in a random item popping out of them. Under normal circumstances, the form you get when selecting this stage is completely random. However, you can force one form or the other by holding down a button while selecting the stage. While 1-1 has returned in future Smash games, for some reason 1-2 never returned after Brawl, leaving 1-1 the de facto standard form of Mushroomy Kingdom. Next up, we have the stage known as Mario Circuit. This stage is a rather basic Mario Kart inspired stage that loops around in a figure 8. One part of the stage has the track on the bottom, while the upper half has platforms that serve as jump ramps for the upper part of the track. Actual kart racers also appear on this stage, all of which are Shy Guys. These racers can be hit with attacks or can slam into players as they drive past. All of the drivers being Shy Guys is likely a reference to the download play features in both Mario Kart DS and Mario Kart 7, where a friend could play with you locally on their system without owning the game, only capable of racing as a Shy Guy. The figure 8 design of this stage is taken from figure 8 circuit in Mario Kart DS, with similar elements existing in both the game and the stage. In fact, this is even more evident in Ultimate, where the stage was literally renamed to figure 8 circuit to avoid confusion with other similarly named stages. In the background, we can see a big jumbotron, which indicates where the racers on the track currently are, as well as their placements. This idea was taken from the same feature in Mario Kart DS, where you could see a full track overview and current placements on the bottom screen by tapping the touchscreen. They just took that idea and slapped it onto a giant jumbo screen. 
Next, let's quickly talk about the Mario Brothers stage. This stage is a recreation of the first stage in the arcade game Mario Brothers. Enemies appear from the pipes at the top and make their way down the stage, ultimately entering the pipes at the bottom if left alone. In the arcade game, the ultimate goal is to defeat all of the enemies. In Smash, all of these enemies still spawn, but the goal is obviously still to defeat your opponent. The enemies can be defeated by an attack or by jumping and hitting them from below. While in the arcade game they are defeated, they can be picked up after being attacked and smashed and used as an incredibly powerful item. The stage even has a POW block that will defeat all enemies currently on screen. In Brawl, the sides of the screen serve as the blast zones. In Ultimate, this is still the case. However, now players can also wrap around the screen, walking to the left and appearing on the right, or vice versa, just like in the actual arcade game. However, if a player is hit while crossing this threshold, the blast zones once again take effect and that player will die. For the third time ever, we need to talk about a stage named Yoshi's Island. They really love that name, don't they? This is a fairly straightforward stage. There is basic, sloped ground on the bottom with a flat platform above it that regularly tilts back and forth. Like Yoshi's story in Melee, Fly Guys will often fly around on this stage, and with items on they will again carry food and drop it when attacked. Additionally, we have the inclusion of Blargwitch, which are enemies that were first introduced in Yoshi's Island on the SNES. These are big blob-like creatures that have platforms on their heads, and they'll occasionally appear on the left or right side of the main stage. The big feature of this stage is that it changes form over the course of the match. There are four forms in total, each representing a different season. Spring, Summer, Autumn, and Winter. Each of these forms match seasons that are found in levels of Yoshi's Island, they've simply been combined into a single stage. There is no season changing stage in the game, this is just a creative liberty on the part of the Smash development team. And the next stage we're going to quickly tackle is Rumble Falls. Rumble Falls is a giant auto-scrolling level that takes you up the side of a mountain with a waterfall, fighting on various wooden and stone platforms or bridges. This stage is in fact inspired by two levels found in Donkey Kong Jungle Beat. The bottom half of this stage is, of course, inspired by the level Rumble Falls, the first level in the Pineapple Kingdom. While the concept of the stage is the same, the platform layout is completely original, along with other elements such as ladders, spikes, and switches. The top half of the stage is inspired by Sky Garden, the second level of the Orange Kingdom. Again, the inspiration for this is mostly taken from the overall concept of the level, with Smash throwing a bunch of its own ideas into it. Like this plane, which doesn't appear anywhere in Jungle Beat. This is another stage that has never returned in any form in future Smash titles. The other Donkey Kong stage is a huge throwback, 75M. This stage is a recreation of the third level in the Donkey Kong arcade game, literally named 75M. Naturally, some liberties have been taken in order to adapt this stage for Smash, such as removing the bottom platform that stretches across the screen, but overall this is a pretty faithful recreation. There are ladders and elevators, fireballs, and springs that act as stage hazards, as well as certain items that give you points. While these points are tallied up at the very top of the screen, they don't actually impact game play in any way. At the top of the stage is an 8-bit Donkey Kong that exists mostly in the background. Periodically throughout the fight, Donkey Kong's arcade jingle will play and he will come onto the actual stage, serving as a big stage hazard before going back into the background. The Brawl and Smash for Wii U versions of the stage are graphically based on the NES port of Donkey Kong, while Ultimate changes up by making it more accurate to the original arcade release. Next, we have the first new Zelda stage in Brawl, the Bridge of Elden. This is a completely flat, long stage, where in the background you can see Hyrule Castle. This stage is pulled straight from The Legend of Zelda Twilight Princess and plot points that exist around this bridge in the Elden Province. In Twilight Princess, Link battles King Bulbin on the Bridge of Elden, with the stage visually matching this point of the story. Later on, Link crosses this bridge again, with a giant section of it being teleported away moments later, making it impossible to go backwards. Eventually, this piece is found and restored to the bridge via the Twilight Portal. The Smash version of the stage sort of combines these two events into a single one, creating a stage hazard. Periodically, King Bulbin's horn will be heard, and he will ride by from either the left or right side on Lord Bulbo. Sometimes when this happens, King Bulbin will drop a bomb barrel in the center of the stage, which will then explode and destroy the middle chunk of the bridge, just like in Twilight Princess. The Smash game will continue for some time before a Twilight Portal will appear above the bridge and restore it to perfection, ready to be destroyed by King Bulbin once again. So clearly the events didn't happen this way in Twilight Princess, but they were sort of mishmashed together to be something slightly Smash original and slightly based on the game of origin. The other new Zelda stage introduced in Brawl was Pirate Ship. 
While Bridge of Elden was inspired by Twilight Princess, Pirate Ship comes from the Wind Waker. The main portion of the stage is taken from the pirate ship sailed by Tetra and her pirate crew. It sails along the water, with players able to fall off of it and swim in the water. It also has a catapult that will occasionally launch, based on the catapult that Link is flung off of at the Forbidden Fortress. Over the course of the match, multiple different elements will appear in order to interfere with the fight. The first is the King of Red Lions appearing on the right side, not only as a reference to Link's ship and companion in the game, but also as an additional platform that can be fought on. The pirate ship also passes an enemy lookout platform, which will fire bombs at it, which can potentially hit players. The ship can also run aground on a small rocky island. After that, the island apparently will sink back into the ocean, with the ship continuing on its merry way. Finally, the weather will get cloudy, and a cyclone will appear in the background before completely engulfing the ship and launching it high into the air above the clouds, where all is calm, and you can see a sun and a nice little rainbow. And then it comes all careening back down to the ocean. While this never happened specifically to the pirate ship, Link can perform the Ballad of Gales while on the King of Red Lions, which will use cyclones to warp the pair to various locations around the ocean, so this is most likely the inspiration for this segment of the stage. Norfair is the first new Metroid stage introduced in Brawl. This is a series of five platforms surrounded by an entire area made of lava. It's based on Norfair's appearance in both Super Metroid and Metroid Zero Mission, but obviously made far more elaborate because of the improved graphical capability of the Wii and beyond. In Super Metroid, there's a section where Samus must climb to the top of a room and exit before lava completely engulfs her and she dies. A similar concept takes place on this stage, with a huge tidal wave of lava rushing towards the stage, with the only safety being small shelters that pop up. These shelters themselves are based on the doors in the Metroid series that need to be shot in order to be opened, though in Smash any attack will do, and the shelters themselves are a completely Smash original idea. Other concepts like this are also used, with magma rising from the bottom or taking over half of the screen from the left or right. The other new Metroid stage is Frigate Orpheon. This stage is based on the beginning of Metroid Prime, where Samus arrives thanks to a distress signal. In this opening segment, she fights the Parasite Queen that has escaped. This boss battle and the environment that it takes place in is what inspired the design for the stage. The stage itself has platforms that change shape and layout, an original concept designed to help make the stage more unique. This stage also has a pretty unique feature of an alarm going off and the stage doing a complete 180. While this never happens during the events of Metroid Prime, it could be a very loose reference to Frigate Orpheon collapsing and crashing after Parasite Queen is defeated. Next, let's talk Halberd, the ship of the mysterious warrior Meta Knight. This stage starts out in a large hangar before a platform rises and takes off into the sky above an ocean at sunset. The platform will fly around with the Halberd ship in the background before landing on the main deck of the ship. While on this platform, the combo cannon will attempt to attack players. These attacks are a giant mechanized arm, a giant laser beam, and cannonballs. This stage was designed off of the events of Kirby Superstar Revenge of Meta Knight. Kirby must sneak onto the Halberd and stop Meta Knight from attempting to take over Dreamland. Most of the elements, the hangar at the beginning, the presence of the combo cannon, and even the lighting of the stage are all pulled directly from the appearance in Superstar. The design of the Halberd has been modified from its appearance in Superstar, and it would serve as the basis for future appearances of the Halberd in Kirby games created after Brawl's release. From one flying ship to another, next let's move on to Lilac Cruise. The entire physical stage takes place on the back of a spaceship flying around the events of various space battles. This stage is notorious for its ability to tilt back and forth, providing more immersion for the actual stage, but occasionally impacting the use of certain moves. There are a few events that take place on this stage that are loosely inspired by events in the Star Fox series. The battle between Andros Army and the Cornarian Defense Force from the beginning of Star Fox Assault, any number of appearances of Star Wolf battling Star Fox, and the navigation of ships through asteroid fields. The actual ship that players fight on is a completely Smash original creation, though it was actually given a name, Pleiades, based on the real-life star cluster found 444 light-years from Earth. Interestingly, this is the only Star Fox stage in all of Super Smash Bros. history to not take place atop the Great Fox. Next, we've got Pokemon Stadium 2. As the name suggests, this is a spiritual successor to Pokemon Stadium from Melee, with the naming convention being taken from the actual Pokemon Stadium series. Layout-wise, the default form of this stage is pretty much exactly the same as Stadium 1, just with a different aesthetic to distinguish the two. The real meat and potatoes of this stage is of course in the transformations, which are all new forms for this sequel stage. Like Stadium 1, they are all based on a Pokemon typing, but unlike Stadium 1, they feature even more changes as well as the presence of Pokemon related to that form's typing. First, we have the Electric Form, which seems to be inspired by the power plants found in Pokemon. 
This form also has conveyor belts on the sides that drag players to the edges, making it difficult to recover. In the background, we also have an Electivire, the evolved form of Electabuzz, and Magnezone, the evolved form of Magneton. Both are electric types, and both are new evolutions introduced for pre-existing Pokémon in Pokémon Diamond and Pearl, the then most recent Pokémon games. Next is a flying form that spawns fans on the floor, which push air currents up and make all of the fighters float in the air, making the battles primarily aerial-focused. In the background, we can see a Drifloon, a Hoppit, and a Skarmory, all flying-type Pokémon. Next, a ground form, which spawns a sort of excavation site where it appears people are hunting for Pokémon fossils, with the Helix fossil seen in a wall and bones found on the ground. It's kind of ironic considering none of the fossil Pokémon are ground-type. However, we do have two ground-types in the background, Dugtrio in the center and Cubone up on the scaffolding. Lastly, we have the ice form, which appears to be inspired by a cabin up in the snowy mountains. Ice physics plague this form of the stage, as you would expect. Both Snover and Snowrun are seen on this stage, both ice types and both coincidentally using a snow pun in their names. Our other new Pokémon stage is Spear Pillar. This is the first stage since Saffron City in Smash 64 to be solidly based on a location found in the Pokémon games. Spear Pillar is the peak of Mount Coronet in the Sinnoh region, and is the location of the climax of the story in Pokémon Diamond, Pearl, and Platinum. The stage is a more realistic interpretation of Spear Pillar, as if it were at the top of a mountain range. The sort of destroyed temple is on the top layer, and the bottom layer is more of a cave, similar to the cave you have to traverse through to get to the peak. The most notable part of the stage is the pedestal in the center, which can summon one of three Pokémon at random, Dialga, Palkia, or Cresselia. Dialga and Palkia are the primary legendaries of Diamond and Pearl, while Cresselia is simply a secondary legendary Pokémon from those games. All three of these Pokémon have different effects that impact play on the stage. First, both Dialga and Palkia can tilt the screen, cause an earthquake breaking a part of the stage, or fire a laser either vertically or horizontally. Additionally, each Pokémon has more specialized effects that they can perform. Dialga, the Pokémon god of time, can slow down time for a brief period. Additionally, it can leap onto the actual fighting area of the stage and perform Roar of Time, dealing damage to anyone that it hits. Palkia, the Pokémon god of space, can reduce gravity, making everyone floatier. It can also perfectly mirror the screen, or completely flip the stage upside down. Cresselia, one of the lunar duo of Sinnoh, has two different attacks. First is a Crescent Energy Beam that slowly flies across the screen, acting as a constant hazard. The other is a more concentrated barrage of Crescent Beams, firing them one by one across the stage. In the background of the stage, it's possible to see one of the three Lake Guardians, another trio of legendary Pokémon from Sinnoh. Uxie, Mesprit, and Azelf can all possibly be seen as a reference to the role that they play during the story segment at Spear Pillar. Next, let's move on to a new F-Zero stage, Port Town Arrow Dive. This stage is another one based off of a track found in the F-Zero series. Port Town is a regular location in the F-Zero series and also serves as the home of Captain Falcon. While both the Mute City and Big Blue stages before it were from F-Zero X, Port Town Arrow Dive is based on its appearance in F-Zero GX, the sequel created for the GameCube after Melee's release. The track as it appears in Smash is ported over directly from F-Zero GX, and as a result is nearly identical to the second race of the Sapphire Cup. The exception is, of course, the platforms that raise and lower throughout different points in the stage for the players to fight on. There are many different sections that the fight takes place on, and as another deviation from other F-Zero stages before it, this one doesn't stop at the same points every time, making each lap effectively unique. Like other F-Zero stages, the vehicles that are participating in the race in the background can and will hit players for massive knockback and damage, and because the stage is based off of GX, the vehicles too use their updated GX designs. Next, we have the first ever Fire Emblem stage in all of Smash, Castle Siege. The planned Fire Emblem stage for Melee ended up being scrapped during development, which is why this is the first. At this point in Smash history, there had been three Fire Emblem characters in Smash total with Marth and Ike appearing in Brawl, and Roy being left back in Melee. As a result, Castle Siege seems to have been designed to try to make up for lost time, and was developed as a very generic Fire Emblem stage, representing the series as the whole, rather than one specific title. The stage starts out at a generic castle, with the actual fight taking place on some platforms with the castle in the background. We can also see in the background that the castle is being attacked by large fireballs because, as the stage name suggests, this castle is under siege, which is a recurring story element used throughout the Fire Emblem series. After some time, the stage will begin transitioning, and the players will then find themselves on the inside of the castle in a throne room. The actual fight takes place on giant statues holding up platforms, with the statues capable of being destroyed by attacks, potentially a reference to destructible terrain found in Fire Emblem games. 
Additionally, in the background we can see the actual focal point of the throne room, with the actual throne visible, surrounded by groups of soldiers. These soldiers are all wearing red armor, which is a nod to the enemy units in Fire Emblem games being red. The actual throne has a character sitting on it. In Brawl and Smash for Wii U, this character is the Black Knight, the antagonist from both Fire Emblem Path of Radiance and Radiant Dawn. In the Smash Ultimate version of the stage though, it's simply a more generic character wearing red armor, possibly replacing the Black Knight due to his addition as an assist trophy. Finally, after this section, we see another transition which takes the players to an underground, lava-filled cavern. While also rather generic, the general inspiration for this area is similar areas that Fire Emblem has across multiple games in the series. It's time to clock in and go to work at WarioWare Inc. This stage is a fusion of multiple WarioWare games. WarioWare Inc. Mega Micro Games, WarioWare Twisted, and WarioWare Touched. The core elements of the main stage are a mix of design elements from Wario's house and the Variety Tower, both found in Mega Micro Games. The Variety Tower is a bonus mode that essentially serves as a minigame stamina mode, constantly throwing the player into minigames until they run out of lives. The stage's function in Smash is kinda similar. The Variety Tower will open up and pull the players into a random minigame. Each minigame has a different goal to accomplish, and any players who perform this goal in the allotted time will receive a reward for doing so. Becoming Giant, Metal, Invincible, or Healing Damage are all rewards that can be won. Failing the minigame will simply result in the player receiving nothing. There are 9 total minigames available on this stage, which are the following. Aerospace. Here the goal is simply to avoid getting hit by any arrows. Blowing up. Here the goal is to pop all of the poppers, and if done, everyone who popped one will receive a reward. Crackdown. A character in the background will ready his hammer and slam it on a mountain. The player must time their jump so that they are in the air when this hammer is slammed. Anyone touching the ground will be buried and will not receive a reward. Crazy Cars. The goal for this game is to avoid a car that will come speeding by, with the direction indicated ahead of it. Don't move. In order to win, players must not execute any inputs once the micro game begins. Kitty Cover. Here, a cat is underneath an umbrella while it's raining. Players need to stay dry underneath the umbrella. Additionally, the rain does gradual damage if you're hit by it. Winning the micro game is determined by not taking any damage from the rain. Lose your marble. A block of marble sits in a blank area, and players' attacks will chisel it to reveal a sculpture beneath. The sculpture must be fully revealed in order for the micro game to be won, with everyone who participated receiving a reward. The sculptures underneath are taken from WarioWare Touched, with three possibilities. Michelangelo's statue of David wearing a speedo, an Easter Island head, or a toilet. Soul Man. This micro game spawns players out in an open field area, and a shadow will appear before a giant foot slams down and buries any players who are hit. Avoiding the foot results in a win. And lastly, Taunt. Jimmy T is seen in the background through a camera viewfinder, and players must taunt at the same time the picture is being taken in order to win the game. With the exception of Don't Move and Taunt, every micro game is taken from a real micro game in the WarioWare series, and just adjusted a little bit for Smash. Let's now travel to the Distant Planet, the home stage for Olimar representing the Pikmin series. Both the layout and the background of the stage aren't pulled one-to-one -one from anything in the Pikmin series, which at the time of Brawl's release only had two entries. However, the overall design of the level is inspired by two levels in these two entries, Forest of Hope from Pikmin 1 and Awakening Wood, a level inspired by Forest of Hope from Pikmin 2. Throughout the level you can find the Pikmin chips, known as onions, as well as flowers that bloom colored number pellets. If the player throws pellets into the onions, items will pop out. The larger the number, the more items, and if the color matches, even more items will spawn. This is pulled directly from the same concept in Pikmin, except instead of items spawning, more Pikmin spawn relative to the pellet's number and color. Occasionally, a bulborb will show up on the right side. His mouth can open up, and if a player lands on his mouth, he will bite down, trapping them and pulling them into the blast zone. In Ultimate, he will still bite down, however, it results instead in an instant KO. Bulborbs are aggressive enemies in the Pikmin series, who will attack and attempt to eat Pikmin, so in Smash, they instead try to eat the players. There will also occasionally be a downpour of rain, which causes a torrent of water to rush down the hill to the left. If players are caught in this water, they can very easily fall off and die. The only thing I can assume this is a reference to is either showing how small Olimar is in relation to the planet in Pikmin, or the mechanic of certain Pikmin drowning in water. In the background, we can see another Bulborb who is just snoozing away. Additionally, we can see another type of enemy in the background, the Cloaking Burrow Knit. In Brawl and Smash for 3DS, they're just part of a low-resolution image in the background. However, in Ultimate, everything is fully modeled out and even has animations. Now, let's move on to the stage that everyone has spent more time on than they can count, Smashville. 
Smashville is inspired by the idea of creating and naming your own town in the Animal Crossing series, with the main game this stage comes from being Animal Crossing Wild World for the Nintendo DS. In this case, Sakurai named his town Smashville. The stage itself is incredibly basic, with a simple main stage section and a floating platform going back and forth in the center. The only additional element is occasionally a balloon that floats across the stage. With items on, this balloon will have a piece of food that can be knocked down if attacked, otherwise the balloon just appears on its own. Balloons are commonly found in Animal Crossing, usually carrying a present, and can be shot down with slingshots. The stage travels throughout the town of Smashville, with a ton of Animal Crossing elements in the background that you would find during any typical playthrough of an Animal Crossing town. The stage also follows the system clock and will change the time of day on this stage with four different settings. Dawn, Day, Evening, and Night. Additionally, we have more specific elements in this town. First, the buildings are all notable locations visited in Animal Crossing. The Able Sisters, a clothing shop. Interestingly, in Brawl and Smash for Wii U, this building sign is the French localization for Able Sisters no matter what language you're playing. This is because in the Japanese versions of Animal Crossing, this store uses the French name just because it sounds fancier and it's a fashion store, and this carries over into Smash. However, this shouldn't appear when the game is in English, and in Ultimate, this error is rectified. The museum, which is where the player can turn in various specimens, like bugs or fossils, to be cataloged. The town hall, where a ton happens, from civic duties to paying off debts and disposing of items. Additionally, you can see the player's house in the background, as well as miscellaneous villagers' houses. Aside from buildings, you can see multiple activities take place in the background. Cap'n's taxi can be seen driving, Gulliver's flying saucer can be seen in flight, and Pete the Mailman can be seen as well. But of course, the biggest attraction for Smashville are the villagers and other NPCs that can appear just behind the action of the Smash Battle. There are 30 possible appearances in various combinations on this stage of various Animal Crossing characters, so I won't be diving into them in depth. However, these are all of the characters that can appear. There's a lot of them. In addition to these 30 characters, there is one more special one. K.K. Slider. K.K. Slider is a dog who performs concerts for the town, appearing in every single entry in the Animal Crossing series. He's had various roles in the entire series, however Smashville follows his original function, performing a concert from 8pm to 12am on Saturday nights only. When K.K. Slider plays, the music tracks are no longer the standard music you would hear at any other time on Smashville, but instead real tracks that K.K. Slider performs, all of which debuted in the first entry of the game, Dabutso no Mori. Next up, we have another Mother Series stage, this time it's New Pork City. New Pork City is the final location of Mother 3, built by Porky to commemorate the final of the seven needles being pulled. There are many attractions there for the occasion, and it's all eclipsed by the Empire Porky Building, a 100-story building at the top of the city. The stage itself takes place on some rather basic platforms that vaguely match with the walkways of New Pork City. The actual city itself is in the background, and while it rips the sprites straight from Mother 3, it definitely scales up the size of the city to make it even more massive than it appears in the original game. The stage also has three elements found throughout Newport City. The first is the giant swinging boat, a common amusement park ride that is found in the amusement park in Mother 3. In Smash, it acts as a platform that simply moves back and forth in a swinging arc. There's also a flying limousine that will serve as another platform, slowly making its way across the screen. This comes from the flying limousine that Porky sent to bring Lucas and the party to Newport City. Lastly, the ultimate chimera will occasionally spawn at a random part of the stage. In Mother 3, the ultimate chimera is the result of Porky's scientists creating the ultimate killing machine, with fleeing the only course of action when faced with it. Likewise, in Smash, you don't want to be attacked by the ultimate chimera. In Brawl, it will result in 100% worth of damage and send you flying, almost surely killing you every time. In its return in Ultimate, it will instead just instantly KO you. Oh, and yeah, New Pork City is a combination of New York City and Porky's name. Next, we have a brand new Ice Climber stage, Summit. According to Smash director Masahiro Sakurai, this stage is the summit of Icicle Mountain, the previous Ice Climber stage found in Super Smash Bros. Melee. Despite the inconsistencies there, we'll just roll with that description. Like Icicle Mountain before it, nearly all of this is Smash Original. It mostly takes concepts that were implied in the gameplay of Ice Climber for the NES and extrapolates them for Smash. The floor of this stage is all ice, and so naturally it's incredibly slippery, with only the Ice Climbers able to walk normally on it, which is kind of a neat detail. Occasionally, vegetables will appear on the stage and they can be eaten to regain some health. However, these items are not from the generic food item slot. Instead, these are based on the vegetables as they appear in Ice Climber for the NES. 
The stage itself starts out solid, but then eventually breaks off and slides down the side of the mountain, possibly inspired by real-life glaciers having giant chunks fall off regularly. After this segment, the stage lands in some water. A little bit after that, the polar bear in the background will jump and force the stage deeper into the water with the bottom layer fully submerged. The polar bear jumping here actually has a reference. If the player is taking too long to beat a level in Ice Climber, the polar bear will jump up and slam down to force the screen to scroll by one level, potentially killing them. Though it's possible to swim on this stage, it's not exactly advisable, as a giant fish can pop up and eat them, pulling them down underwater, resulting in a KO. Ironically though, this giant fish doesn't appear in Ice Climber at all, but instead appears in another NES game, Balloon Fight. The background of the stage features an icy tundra and, more notably, what appears to be similar to the Aurora Borealis, a phenomenon in the Arctic and Antarctic that causes similar lights to appear in the sky. Next, let's move on to the Smash Bros. series' first ever Kid Icarus stage, Sky World. This stage naturally takes place on a world in the sky, with platforms that are supported by fluffy little clouds. These platforms can be attacked and destroyed, but the clouds can still act as platforms when this happens. The name Sky World comes from the third level in Kid Icarus and Kid Icarus of Myths and Monsters, which has the same name. Additionally, it also has stone platforms and cloud platforms. However, in overall execution, this stage is pretty much entirely Smash original, following Brawl's overall idea of modernizing Pit and his home series for the current day. In the background to the left, we can see a giant temple with a statue of Palutena, which is possibly meant to be Palutena's temple. Outside of this though, there aren't really any references for this stage. Next, we have a spiritual successor to Mr. Game & Watch's Flat Zone stage from Melee, known simply as Flat Zone 2. The basic idea and execution of this stage is exactly the same as Flat Zone 1, with the actual Smash battle taking place inside of a Game & Watch device. This time though, the actual design of the handheld comes from the 1981 re-release of Fire as a part of the widescreen series of games. And like the previous stage, the game name is replaced simply by the word Smash Bros. This time, the stage incorporates four different Game & Watch games into its layout. The stage always starts out on the layout taken from the game Fire, where people in a burning building jump out and try to land on a fireman's trampoline. Each form after Fire is random, though there is some indication of what's up next by what appears on screen ahead of the transformation. Next we have a screen based on the bottom screen of Oil Panic, a game and watch game that had two screens. In that game, the player tries to fill a bucket with oil and pass it on to a second character on the bottom screen, who fills gas for a man and woman. However, in Smash, this second character is missing, leaving just the man and woman. These two will attack players if they are attacked. That's not very nice. There's also a form based on the game Lion, where you play as lion tamers trying to keep lions from escaping their cage. The lion is missing from this form of the stage, with just the lion tamers there. These two will smack players back towards the cage, with the potential to ping pong them back and forth if unlucky. And lastly, we have a form based on Chef, a game where you must juggle food to keep it from hitting the ground. In the Smash stage, this chef will throw food out of his frying pan, similar to Game & Watch's neutral special, damaging players hit by the food. However, you can take out your anger on all the laggy Game & Watches you have to play on Quick Play by being able to attack this chef, who will fly off screen from a strong enough attack. Our next stage is a super unique one, and one of my favorites, PictoChat. This is inspired by the small application found on the Nintendo DS, which was a chat room of sorts that could be used with other DS owners using the local communication of the console. It could be used to type out messages, but more importantly, it could be used to draw little pictures, which is what most people ended up using it for. This stage relies heavily on the drawing aspect of the app. The only platform that exists is this solid black one at the bottom, which doubles as a reference to the now entering prompt that would appear in PictoChat, though this of course states the character's names rather than a user's name. The entire the rest of the stage is drawn out by some invisible god user, serving as the rest of the platforms and hazards. For example, there's a pendulum that swings back and forth, a whale spouting water that will blast players upwards, or wind that gets drawn and slightly pushes players to one side, sorta like Wispy Woods. There are 27 total drawings in this stage that I won't bore you with, since they're all pretty much Smash original, just with some cute ideas for hazards that no other stage could really have. The one exception is a drawing of a piranha plant, obviously based on the Mario enemy. Its sharp teeth act as hitboxes and do high knockback if hit by them. Not only does this stage represent a series that has no fighters, it also doesn't return in its current form in any game beyond Brawl. Kinda, but we'll get into that later. Another stage from a series with no fighters is Hen and Bow, this neon green headache waiting to happen. This stage comes to us from the video game Electroplankton, an interactive music game developed for the Nintendo DS. 
This game allowed the player to interact with small plankton and manipulate the environment to create different music. There were multiple scenarios available in the game, one of which was entitled Hannonbow, where the player could arrange and rearrange leaves on a tree for the Hannonbow creatures to bounce off of. The stage in Smash combines two tiers of Hannonbow into a single entity. The creatures are a background element and will actually bounce off of the leaves, making noises. Players' attacks will change the leaves' orientation, which impacts how the Hannonbow bounce around and as a result, changes the sound of the tones. In Brawl, this is the only source of music on the stage, though in Ultimate, actual music can be played as well. It's a rather straightforward stage, but I think it was really clever to essentially recreate Electroplankton's entire mechanic inside of Smash and have it be impacted by characters' attacks. It's really quite neat, even if I personally kind of find it annoying to play on sometimes. The first ever third-party stage in Smash is none other than Snake's home stage, Shadow Moses Island. Shadow Moses is an island that appears to be a nuclear weapons disposal facility before it's revealed to actually be a cover for a weapons development complex. The stage itself is based on the first area of Shadow Moses Island in Metal Gear Solid 1. The layout is pretty basic, with platforms in the middle and destroyable towers on either side. In this section, a watchtower has a searchlight out looking for threats, and if Snake is seen, guards will attack him. This searchlight also appears in Smash, complete with the classic Metal Gear Solid the light will then continue to follow the player who was seen by it for a bit, but nothing happens with it. It's just a kind of fun immersive detail for the stage. The building in the background will occasionally explode, with the possibility of several Metal Gears being the cause. The Metal Gear Rex, the mech that Snake was sent to destroy on Shadow Moses Island in Metal Gear Solid 1, the Metal Gear Ray, another recurring mech that appears on the island in Metal Gear Solid 4, or two Geckos, smaller mechs that were designed for use in ground combat, which also first appeared in Metal Gear Solid 4. Interestingly though, both the design for the geckos and the appearance of the Metal Gear Ray on Shadow Moses Island first debuted in Smash, as the release of Brawl precedes the release of Metal Gear Solid 4 by five months. And the final stage in Brawl, which really needs no introduction, is Green Hill Zone. Green Hill Zone is the very first level in the very first Sonic the Hedgehog game, and well, lots of Sonic games after that, and it's essentially synonymous with Sonic himself. The playable area of the stage loosely comes from a section in the opening of Green Hill Zone Act 1 from Sonic the Hedgehog. Bridge, followed by a dip, followed by a grassy area. However, there are some differences added just for Smash. The dip in the middle has three sections that, if damaged enough, will collapse in a similar way to ground that collapses in Sonic, resulting in a pit that can kill. Additionally, checkpoint lampposts will occasionally appear throughout the stage as well, based on their design from Sonic 1. While these are naturally checkpoints for if the player dies, in Smash they act as hazards. A player can attack them and it will cause them to turn red and start spinning, knocking any opponents who contact it. In the background we can see a loop-de-loop, -loop, a staple of the Sonic series. On top we can see a 1-up monitor, which are often on top of loops like this as it typically is difficult to get up there. Over the course of the match, three different characters can be seen running this loop. The first is Miles Tails Prower, Sonic's right-hand man. The second is Knuckles the Echidna, Sonic's rival turned friend. And lastly is Silver the Hedgehog, a recent character introduced in the 2006 reboot title Sonic the Hedgehog. All three characters use their general designs from Sonic 06, even in the jump to Smash 4 and Ultimate. The first stage found in both Smash for 3DS and Wii U is none other than Boxing Ring. The basis for this stage is of course the Punch-Out series. It's a fairly straightforward stage. A boxing ring is in the middle, with walkways on the left and right side, and adoring fans in both the foreground and background. Additionally, there is a giant light fixture at the top illuminating the ring, which can also be attacked and knocked down as a stage hazard. The stage itself is an interesting fusion of Smash original concepts combined with elements from the reboot of Punch-Out for the Wii, more specifically, the appearance of the ring in the world circuit. The background of the stage also features a Jumbotron, which has a number of details. Initially, it will just display the Smash battle, as though this was taking place at a real-life sporting event for people to look at. Occasionally, text will also appear based on what's happening in the match, such as a Smash Ball appearing or during sudden death. In Smash for Wii U, this Jumbotron will eventually transition into a stat-like screen. On the left and right, two of the fighters will be displayed with their character renders and a special title, just like real-life boxers might have. Every single character in the game has a unique boxing ring title inspired by their history, characterization, or just some kind of pun. All alternate character costumes also have different titles, such as the Koopalings, Alf, or variations of Hero. I won't go through them all since there are well over 100, and most are pretty self-explanatory anyway. The center of the Jumbotron also shows some match stats, including how many matches have been played, the current leader of the match, number of KOs, and damage total. The entire premise of this form of the Jumbotron is taken from the second screen found on the Punch-Out! arcade game, 
where both boxers are on either side and similar stats are displayed down the middle. Smash just adapts this for their own game and expands on the ideas. Boxing Ring also has a not-so-secret alternate form where all of the punch-out aesthetics are replaced with the Smash Bros name and logo. Functionally, this is exactly the same as the first variant, it's just a fun alternate appearance that makes the stage feel more Smash original. Either of these forms can be chosen via a button press when selecting the stage, and both return in the jump to ultimate as well. Our next shared stage between the versions comes from the Xenoblade series, Gower Plain from Xenoblade Chronicles. This stage features a rocky cliffside with a ravine in the center and smaller rock platforms underneath the larger cliffs. In the background, we can see a big grassy plain and at the horizon, a giant mechanical being, the Makanis, one of the two giant titans that serve as Shulk's world. The Makanis is the counterpart to the Bionis, the titan where Gower Plain exists and which Shulk lives on. Gower Plain is one of the earlier regions that Shulk and the party visit, located on Bionis Leg. In Smash for 3DS, this is the extent of the stage. However, there is much more to the stage in Smash for Wii U. First, there is a pretty big difference between the platforms and blast zones between both versions of the stage. During nighttime, a stage boss has a chance to appear, Metal Face. Metal Face is one of the major antagonists found in Xenoblade Chronicles. He'll appear on stage and begin attacking fighters throughout the night. He can fire cannons and attack with claw swipes, destroying the terrain of the stage in the process. Like most boss characters, he can be attacked and eventually defeated, causing a massive explosion that can damage all players except for the one who dealt the final blow. If he's not defeated, he will simply fly off screen when it becomes daytime. Either way, when morning comes, the terrain will reset to its original form. And whether defeated or not, Metal Face can reappear during multiple night cycles. The inclusion of Gower Plane on both the 3DS and Wii U versions could possibly be seen as a nod to the game's existence on both home console and handheld, with the original game being a Wii release and the 3DS remake releasing only six months after Smash for 3DS. Next, we have Wily Castle from the Mega Man series. This stage features a very robotic platform where, in the background, we can see Dr. Wily's castle proper, which is based on its appearance from Mega Man 2. Each version of this stage features a different implementation of moving platforms. On Smash for 3DS, platforms will drop from above the main stage and hover there. There are also a couple of different types of platforms on rails on the left and right sides that will move either back and forth or up and down. These are inspired by platforms found in Bright Man stage and the Taco Trash boss room in Mega Man 4 and in Tomahawk Man stage in Mega Man 6. On Smash for Wii U, platforms will travel along small colored rails, eventually dropping when they reach the end of the path. These are inspired by platforms that first appeared in Guts Man stage in Mega Man 1. And in the jump to Ultimate, all of these platforms are combined into one single stage. In Smash for 3DS, the stage takes place at daytime, while in Wii U, it's nighttime. Regardless of the version you're playing on, after a while a boss character will appear. The Yellow Devil. The Yellow Devil is a boss that first appeared towards the end of the first Mega Man game, attacking by dividing itself into small yellow orbs before returning to its normal state, where it can attack with lasers. Mega Man's only means of damaging it is to attack it in its eye when it's in its normal form. The same is true in Smash. The Yellow Devil will fire itself in orb form from Wily's castle, coming together on the actual stage. It'll fire a few lasers, then alternate sides in its orb form again, repeating the process. All fighters can attack its eye when in its normal form, and eventually it can be defeated. It will then cause a large explosion that damages all except whoever dealt the final blow. And if it isn't defeated, it will simply go away after a short time. And we have one final stage for now, Duck Hunt, a stage that was free in an update for Smash for 3DS and which was included at launch in Smash for Wii U. Duck Hunt literally takes the entire game of Duck Hunt from the NES and recreates it in a stage. Rather than having some inexplicable reticle shooting the ducks, instead the ducks are defeated by fighters' attacks. All of these ducks are worth the same number of points as in Duck Hunt, and the HUD at the bottom will update with your hits, misses, and scores. The dog will even appear, reacting to your performance by either holding up the ducks you attacked, or laughing at you like he loves to do. Duck Hunt for NES had three game modes. Game A had one duck appear at a time, while Game B had two ducks appear at a time. Game C included clay pigeons, so it's not really relevant. The stage can summon either one or two ducks per round, so it sort of combines Duck Hunt's two duck center games into one, which is fine since hitting ducks with Smash Fighters is way easier than using the Zapper. There are occasionally patches of grass that exist in the foreground, capable of being a platform for a short time, or even hiding players and items. Additionally, the dog acts as a platform at the end of each round. And that does it for every stage in the base roster of Smash 4 that's shared between both versions, so we'll now move on to the first exclusive stage introduced in Smash for 3DS, which is none other than 3D Land, of course referencing the 3DS game Super Mario 3D Land. 
Rather than being a specific reference to any one level, this stage is a scroller that visits different types of areas that can be found in different levels of Super Mario 3D Land. It starts out on a grasslands area, somewhat based off of World 1-1 in 3D Land. Following that is a valley area, loosely based on World 8-2. There's a downhill slope section, based on World 4-1. And then of course a beach, a more general design that fuses concepts of water levels found all across the game. There are blocks and platforms that either debuted in or use their appearance from Super Mario 3D Land, such as flip panels and note blocks. When playing with items, the brick and question mark blocks will of course spawn out items. However, a neat quirk of this stage is that it offers a higher chance of spawning the Super Leaf if that item is enabled. This is because the Super Leaf made a return in 3D Land after a 23 year absence, being the main gimmick of the title, so I think it's a cute little detail for Smash to have. In Smash Ultimate, this stage was given the HD treatment, though rather than just improving its appearance, the level's design was instead made to be closer to the appearance of 3D Land sequel, Super Mario 3D World. And following 3D Land, we have another handheld Mario-inspired stage, Golden Plains, which is inspired by New Super Mario Bros. 2 for the 3DS. As far as the layout goes, this is basically Smash Original, with really the level design and certain elements being pulled from the first world of New Super Mario Bros. 2. Right away you'll notice that there are coins all over this stage, and that's because the main gimmick of New Super Mario Bros. 2 was collecting coins, with the main goal being to collect 1 million. To reference this, players can collect coins by jumping into them, just like in the Mario series, with a coin counter in the top left to help you keep track. There are standard golden coins, which are each worth one coin. Players can activate blue P-switches when they appear periodically, which add even more coins onto the stage to be collected, also worth one coin each. Finally, red rings can appear, which, when jumped through, spawn eight red coins. While in their home series, collecting all eight typically results in a power-up or one-up mushroom, in Smash, nothing happens when you collect all eight. However, each is instead worth five coins for a total of 40 additional coins if you can get them all in the time limit. When any player collects a total of 100 coins, they will become a Gold Fighter, a power-up of sorts in Smash that offers stronger attacks and super armor, making you essentially a super fighter. This is a direct parallel to the Gold Flower power-up, which turns Mario into Gold Mario, allowing him to throw golden fireballs that can result in coins. The Gold Fighter in Smash doesn't have any of these abilities, though, so the parallel really stops at the fighter becoming similarly golden. Next up we have a new Mario Kart stage, Rainbow Road. Specifically, this version of Rainbow Road is from Mario Kart 7, though Rainbow Road has appeared in every Mario Kart game from the beginning. While concessions were made to adjust the track in small ways, this is, in essence, the track pulled straight out of Mario Kart 7. The theme of the track in this game focused a lot more on the space side of things, with racers actually driving on the moon at one point. The stage follows the standard Mario Kart stage and Smash formula, with a main platform that travels around the racetrack, stopping at various areas along the track to have players fight directly on it. This stage once again has Shy Guys serving as the racers, referencing download play for Mario Kart on handhelds, where players could play local multiplayer without owning the game, forced to play as a Shy Guy. Sadly, this stage never saw a return in Ultimate, leaving one of the cooler Smash 3DS stages stuck on that version of the game. Next, we have the first ever Paper Mario stage in Smash history, literally just called Paper Mario. In a way, this stage is similar to the way that Castle Siege was handled for the Fire Emblem series back in Brawl. By not having much representation in prior games, the Smash team makes up for lost time by referencing multiple entries in the series, making this a stage that transforms to different settings. The starting form the stage takes is a sort of grassy cliffside featuring a windmill. This section is inspired by Hither Thither Hill, the fourth level of World 1 from Paper Mario Sticker Star. Mario must paperize using the fan thing, which causes the fan to appear in the background of the stage and blow the blades of the windmill. In Smash, this same fan appears in the background, which blows strong wind, shoving players to the right while also spinning the windmill. The stage then transitions into a setting found on the ocean at sunset on a large ship. This ship is inspired by the SS Flavion, a ship captained by Flavio that Mario and the party use in Paper Mario The Thousand Year Door, the second entry in the series. While on this form, a big blooper will appear, serving as a stage hazard of sorts. Rather than attacking players as you might expect, the blooper instead causes large waves that will cause the ship to jostle at weird angles, just to throw off the fight a bit. While there isn't an interaction with the big blooper while on the SS Flavion in the games, big bloopers are a common boss in the Paper Mario series, so it just must have felt natural to include this one here. Another possibility during this form is the appearance of the whale, a character from the original
original Paper Mario, who ultimately served as the means to get to Lava Lava Island. In Smash, the whale will appear directly below the SS Flavian and blast water out of its blowhole, causing the ship to raise up in the air, stopping it from rocking, and bringing it closer to the upper blast zone. Again, the whale doesn't have any interaction with the SS Flavian, or any appearance in Thousand Year Door at all for that matter. Likely it's just another inclusion based on the ocean setting. The final form the stage takes on brings us back to a Sticker Star reference, Bowser's Sky Castle, the final level of the game. This is inspired by the entrance to the castle, where a giant statue of Bowser's head appears. However, the head rotating, having different colored eyes, clamping its jaw as an attack, and the clown car colored platforms on either side are all original to Smash to make this form just a bit more engaging. In Sticker Star, this section is purely an entrance to the castle and nothing more. However, the implication of the castle flying in the sky could be a reference to the original Paper Mario, where Bowser's castle was indeed capable of flying in the air. In this stage's upgrade to Ultimate, the actual art style for the stage is updated to match design elements from Paper Mario Color Splash, the entry in the series right after Sticker Star. Leaving the Mario series for now, our next stage is Gerudo Valley, representing the Zelda series. Gerudo Valley is a region found in The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time, perhaps most well known for its absolute banger of a background track. The stage takes place in a mountainous area, with cliffs on the left and right, a river splitting the two down the middle, and a bridge connecting them. This is taken very faithfully from its appearance in Ocarina of Time, with the only exception being the couple of platforms that naturally aren't usually there. Below the bridge are a couple of branches and a set of spikes. This bridge will eventually break, either by taking enough damage or weight, or by running out the pre-existing timer that the stage has. Either way, shortly after this happens, Kume and Kotake will appear while laughing. One of the two at random will attack the field with their magic spell. Kume will attack the left side with the fire spell, causing players on that side to take gradual damage. Kotake will attack the right side with an ice spell, causing a giant spiky iceberg to appear, dealing damage, and of course freezing players. Kume and Kotake are the adoptive mothers of Ganondorf in Ocarina of Time, and also feature as the bosses of the Spirit Temple, which is conveniently the closest temple to Gerudo Valley. The two both attack with their respective element in Ocarina of Time, and upon being defeated by Link, will fuse into a single being known as Twin Rova, capable of using both ice and fire. After a bit, the Song of Time will play on the stage, seemingly resetting it to its original form, repairing the bridge. Just behind the fighting area you can see a tent, which exists in this spot in Ocarina of Time and belongs to the Carpenters. The Garuda people decided to destroy the bridge in order to prevent intruders, and the Carpenters attempted to repair it before being kidnapped by the Garuda. Link can only access this area by jumping the gap with Epona, and he then saves the Carpenters who ultimately end up fixing the bridge. In the further background, we can see Garuda Fortress on the mountainside, a further nod to this segment of the game. While Gerudo Valley first debuted on the N64, everything about this stage is mostly inspired by Ocarina of Time 3D, the 3DS remake, so that still kind of fits in with the game's handheld release focus. Our other new Zelda stage is Spirit Train. As you might have surmised, this stage takes place aboard the Spirit Train, one of the central mechanics from The Legend of Zelda Spirit Tracks for the Nintendo DS. The train speeds down the tracks, with players capable of falling on the track and either getting pulled into the blast zone or hitting the locomotive in the front. In Smash, the Spirit Engine will pull two additional cars. The first is the Solid Passenger Car, which comes standard with the Spirit Train at the beginning of the game. Additionally, it will always start off with the Trusty Freight Car, the first one that Link receives in Spirit Tracks. However, throughout the match, the train will move over towards the right side of the stage, leaving the final card not visible. It will then pull back towards the center with a new car. It'll do this frequently throughout the match, with multiple different cars possible. Aside from the standard car, there's also a broken carriage where players can accidentally fall through the hole, a carriage with multiple platforms haphazardly built on top, a carriage filled with a big pile of coal, making it an uneven surface to stand on, and a carriage that has a building on it, specifically the Linebeck Trading Company, a shop where Link can obtain train parts, though it never appears on a train car in the actual game. Finally, two enemy types will regularly attack the Spirit Train, both of which are found in the actual Spirit Tracks game. The first is the Armored Train, which will slam into the Spirit Train and push it closer to either the left or right blast zone. The other is the Dark Train, which are trains that are designed to explode. They will either approach near the side before exploding, or jump up onto the actual spirit train to explode. During battles on the spirit train, the players can see Toon Link in his Royal Engineer uniform actually driving the train, just as he does in Spirit Tracks. However, if Link or Toon Link, and later on Young Link, are selected as fighters during the match, the engineered Toon Link will instead be replaced by Alfonso, a fellow Royal Engineer who also serves as Toon Link's mentor in Spirit Tracks.
Next up, we have a brand new Kirby stage. In Smash for 3DS, this is simply named Dreamland. However, in Ultimate, it was officially named Dreamland GB for obvious reasons. This stage is based on the first ever Kirby game, Kirby's Dream Land for the Game Boy. However, it takes this reference very seriously and the entirety of the stage takes place inside of an actual dot matrix Game Boy system, making everything the iconic Game Boy Green. Furthermore, when there are only 5 seconds remaining in time matches, the red LED will begin to fade as though the system is about to lose power because of dead batteries. The actual stage starts with the Game Boy's original boot up sequence, with the slowly lowered Nintendo logo and sound effect before loading into the first form of the stage. The stage has seven different forms that represent each of the stages of Kirby's Dream Land. First, we start out on the Green Greens form, representing the first stage of the game. After that, we have forms for both the exterior and interior of Castle Lololo, which serves as a reference to the second stage of the game. Third are the Float Islands, the third stage of the game. While this section features a ship and a water area, fighters can't actually swim on this form of the stage. And then we have the fourth stage of the game, Bubbly Clouds, which takes place presumably high up in the sky using clouds as platforms. Finally, we have two forms representing Mount DDD, the final stage of the game. First is the Boss Rush Lobby, where Kirby needs to take on the previous four bosses once again. Second is the Boxing Ring, the arena for the final showdown with King DDD. All of the sprites for each form of the stage are ripped straight from Kirby's Dream Land and effectively put into Smash 1 to 1, with the only exception being that there are no enemies that appear during actual gameplay. Like I said before, the stage typically appears in the sort of puke green color scheme based on the original Game Boy screen. However, if the L button is held down while selecting this stage, it will instead load a black and white variant of the stage based on later models of the Game Boy retiring the green screen. However, in the jump to Ultimate, while this stage makes a return, the black and white feature unfortunately does not, leaving just the Game Boy green variant. Our next stage is the Unova Pokemon League, a stage based on the location for Pokemon Black and White and Black and White 2. This is the location where the player in both of these game series takes on the members of the Elite Four in their bid to become the champion of the Unova region. However, during the events of Pokemon Black and White, the climax of the story takes place, with N's castle rising out of the ground to surround the Pokemon League. This is ultimately where the player takes on the legendary Pokemon of their respective version, which leads into the main mechanic of this stage. After a bit of fighting, N's castle will rise up in the background. Ramps will appear on either side of the stage, and then one of the two legendary Pokemon will appear, either Reshiram or Zekrom, the main legendaries of Black and White. When Reshiram appears, the Fire Dragon Pokemon will attack using flames. Fire will either engulf the sides or the center of the stage, of course making it more difficult to traverse without taking gradual damage. When Zekrom appears, the Electric Dragon Pokemon will attack with a ball of electricity, which will either attack one of the sides of the stage, destroying the ramp on that side, or it will do another attack on the sides of the stage, which will tilt the stage entirely for a short time. Along with the appearance of these three legendaries, three additional Pokemon can appear. These Pokemon have no impact on gameplay and are merely there for eye candy. These Pokemon are Whimsicott, Milotic, and Shaman. Halfway through Shaman's appearance, it will transform into Shaman's Skyform, a form it takes on when the Cressidia flower is used on it during the daytime. Oddly, none of these Pokemon really have any business at the Unova Pokemon League. None of the Elite Four members use these Pokemon, or even the typings that these Pokemon are. The only logic I can see is for Whimsicott, a Pokemon introduced in Generation 5, so it at least makes sense to show it off on a Generation 5 themed stage. But Milotic and Shaman? I got nothing. This stage's upgrade in Ultimate saw a pretty significant redesign of the overall aesthetic, however the stage is mechanically still the same as it was back on the 3DS. Pokemon's other new 3DS stage is Prism Tower. This stage is based on Lumio City, the biggest city in the Kalos region, the setting for Pokemon X and Y versions. The Kalos region as a whole is inspired by France, and as a result, Lumio City would be Paris and the Prism Tower, its main attraction, is their Eiffel Tower, which also doubles as the Lumio's Gym. The version of the Prism Tower in Smash sort of splits the difference between its appearance in the actual games and its appearance in the Pokemon anime. The stage starts out at the base of the tower, fighting directly on the street. Eventually, platforms will appear out of the ground and take flight, carrying the fighters to about the top of the base of the tower. Then it moves again to about halfway up the spire of the tower, before moving to the very top segment of the tower. Finally, the platforms move to one more location, which are basically just the skies above Lumio City, with the tower prominently in the background. The lighting on the stage progresses throughout a single day, going to a sunset before ultimately landing completely at night, with the city illuminated by tons of lights. 
On the ground form of this stage, we can see some advertisements at the entrance of the tower, which show off features found in Pokemon X and Y. Go Goat Shuffle, Hollow Casters, Pokemon Ami, Roller Skates, Trainer PR videos, and the Kalos Champion herself, Diantha, with a silhouette of a trainer and a Lucario in the background, presumably advertising the Pokemon League. And what would a Pokemon stage be without background Pokemon appearing? Because Prism Tower doubles as the Lumios Gym, which specializes in Electric-type Pokémon, most of the background characters are Electric-types. Helioptile, Magnemite, and Emolga are all possibly seen throughout the stage. To further the reference, Emolga is a part of Lumios Gym Leader Clement's team, while Magnemite and Helioptile are the pre evolved forms of Clement's other two party members, Magneton and Heliolisk. Additionally, two legendary Pokémon are also visible on this stage. Zapdos is here, naturally because it's the electric type, and finally, Evil Toll, the only non-electric Pokémon on the stage, chosen instead because it's one of the legendary duo that is found in Pokémon X and Y. In Smash for 3DS, these Pokémon are kind of rare, but in Ultimate, they appear pretty much every rotation. Next up, we have Mute City, or as it's renamed in Ultimate, Mute City SNES. As the name says, this is a stage inspired by Mute City 1 from the very first F-Zero on the SNES, with the charm of it using the exact same sprites and graphics from that game. The stage infinitely follows the Mute City 1 track, with the fighters on some original platforms in the 16-bit style. The fighters are also joined by the only four machines in F-Zero, the Blue Falcon, Fire Stingray, Golden Fox, and Wild Goose. These machines are also participating in a race, which includes knocking each other into blast zones and regenerating energy, which can all serve as hazards during the match. Overall, this is a fairly basic stage, but I've always personally had a soft spot for stages that use old-school graphics, it really offers a nice contrast. Now let's move on to a brand new Mother Series stage, Magicant. This pink and fluffy stage in the clouds is inspired by the land of Magicant, a world that was created and which resides in Maria's mind in Earthbound Beginnings. Magicant also exists in Earthbound, however this is a separate world from the one in Beginnings, instead created and residing in Nessa's mind. As a result, this stage merges the two general designs into one stage, with notable landmarks from either game missing. Along with the overall design of the stage taking inspiration from both Magicants, many elements appear on the stage based on various moments in the series. A Mobile Sprout walks around acting as a moving platform. The Mobile Sprout is an enemy found in Earthbound, however ironically it never actually appears in Magicant. The Skyrunner, the spacecraft created by Dr. Andonuts in Earthbound, also appears. This will lower from the sky to hang out as an additional platform for a while before rising into the air again. A giant tomato can also rise out of the ground, capable of taking a few hits before being destroyed. This tomato is based on the Magicant found in Earthbound, which has an area that contains gigantic vegetables. An octopus statue is also able to appear out of the ground. This one has a bit more to its origin. In Earthbound, there are occasionally giant pencil statues found throughout the world that block certain paths, requiring the pencil eraser to remove them. However, this was a localization change for the North American release of the game. In the original Japanese, the statues were these octopus statues, requiring the octopus eraser machine to remove them. With Smash being developed by a Japanese developer, it makes sense for the statue that appears to be based on the Japanese version of Earthbound, Mother 2. Dungeon Man also occasionally appears on this stage as a potential platform. Dungeon Man is the name that the character known as Brick Road takes on when he scientifically turned into a living dungeon his lifelong dream. That dude's a weirdo. Flying Men also appear on this stage as a stage hazard. In both Earthbound Beginnings and Earthbound, Flying Men are exclusively found in Magicants, with five found in each one. Ninten and Ness are both capable of recruiting them to aid in battles against enemies. This translates over into Smash's version of Magicant. A flying man will appear on the stage and, when a player walks by them, they will become that player's ally by attacking all other opponents on the stage. In the original games, when flying men are defeated in battle, a tombstone will appear by their homes. In Smash, players can attack the flying men back, and if they're defeated, a tombstone will appear by their spawn point and, eventually, another flying man will spawn. However, an additional detail for this origin is that after five flying men are defeated, no more will spawn, based on only five being available in both Beginnings and Earthbound. Finally, the background of the stage features notable moments in both Earthbound Beginnings and Earthbound. Ninten at his house, along with Mick, his dog, Ninten speaking to Lloyd on the roof of Twinkle Elementary School, Ness and Paula walking around Threed, Ness, Paula, Jeff, and Pooh at the Lumine Hall, and Ness, Paula, Jeff, and Pooh walking in Saturn Valley just before their fight with Gygus. The first new Fire Emblem stage in Smash 4 is Arena Ferox. 
This stage is a sort of combat arena that the characters of Fire Emblem Awakening find themselves at during the events of the game. During Chapter 4, the party meets the East Khan of Ferox. Every few years, the East and West Khans hold a tournament to see who will gain or keep control of the entirety of Ferox. The Shepherds need help with the conflict in Yulis, so they agree to enter the tournament on the East Khan's behalf so that she can gain the authority of the Ferroxi military. During the course of the tournament, the Shepherds fight against a masked swordsman named Marth, who is ultimately revealed to be the time-traveling Lucina, Kron's daughter. The Smash stage is inspired by the arena that this tournament takes place in. The background with screaming viewers and the platform of the stage are all pulled straight from Fire Emblem Awakening. However, this stage also has multiple platform layouts that will rise out of the ground periodically. All of these are Smash original layouts, so they do of course match the aesthetic of the arena. This stage is also the first Fire Emblem stage to be based on a specific location in a specific Fire Emblem game. Following that, our next new stage is Reset Bomb Forest, a stage based on the events of chapters 10 and 11 of Kid Icarus Uprising. Hades sparks a war between two nations by tricking them into desiring the Wish Seed, an item that's said to grant any wish, but which is ultimately completely fake. The battle itself is interrupted by a huge fiery explosion, which is revealed to have been caused by Viridi, the goddess of nature. In order to punish humans, who Viridi sees as scum, she drops what she called a reset bomb onto the area of the battle, resetting it back to a more natural state, turning it into the reset bomb forest, which Pit must then traverse. The stage in Smash loosely follows these events. It first starts out on the ruins of a castle, with the battle between the two nations taking place in the background. After a little bit of time, an image of Aridi will appear in the background, and after a moment, her reset bomb will drop onto the battle and the stage will then transform, now taking on the appearance of the reset bomb forest. A lot of branches have spawned, destroying the castle even further and making the platforms even more unstable, with some of them even being destructible. Along the top and bottom of the forest form of the stage, a long skeletal creature will fly across the screen, damaging players who touch it. This enemy is the Lurchthorn, an enemy of the Forces of Nature faction controlled by Viridi, which is first introduced during the events of Uprising's 11th chapter. Our next stage is a brand new Animal Crossing stage, Tortimer Island. This stage comes from Tortimer Island, a mechanic of Animal Crossing New Leaf for the 3DS. In New Leaf, the player is granted the ability to go to the island by Tortimer using Cap'n's boat. The island is random for each unique save file of New Leaf, but it will remain the same on each visit inside of those saves. The island has a lobby where you can talk to Cap'n's family members. Outside of minigames and exclusive items, the appeal to Tortimer Island is the ability to find unique bugs, fish, and exotic fruits that you can't find in the main town. In Smash, this island can take on many appearances and layouts, all of which are random each time you load the stage, based on the randomized aspect of the island from New Leaf. The lobby will always appear at the northern end of the island, just like in New Leaf, and it's possible to see Tortimer, Grams, Layla, or Leilani at the entrance. Many different trees with different fruits can be found as well, and these fruits can be eaten to heal health, with the exception of coconuts and durians, which are throwing items that can potentially explode. Occasionally, hitting the tree can result in a beehive item spawning, a reference to shaking trees in Animal Crossing and having a beehive drop out. There will always be a dock on either side of the island, and Cap'n will occasionally pull up in his boat, serving as an extended platform for the stage. Also in the water, a shark will occasionally appear, attacking any fighter who gets near. Our next stage is a really cool one, Balloon Fight. Inspired by the NES game of the same name, this stage keeps the 8-bit graphics and many of the mechanics found there. Balloon Fight saw you control a character flying around in a helmet with balloons attached, which as an aside is the source of Villager's Up special. The goal was to fly around these stages popping the balloons of the enemy birds. On later levels, flippers would also be introduced, which will begin to spin when bumped into and deal damage to both player and enemy. A giant fish would appear at the bottom to drag players or enemies under if they get too close. If a player spends too much time on a stage, clouds will electrify and send out sparks, introducing a new hazard for the player to worry about. Lastly, if the player heads to the edge of the screen, they will wrap around and appear on the other side. All of these elements of the game are retained and adapted pretty accurately for Smash. All of the hazards exist, the stage wraps around, and even the fish will appear to drag players beneath the water. Along with this, the stage has three different variations, which are most noticeable by the color of the grass. Either bright green, dark green, or orange. All three of these are possible colors that the balloon fight stages can have, ripped straight from the NES game. Staying in the realm of more obscure stages for Smash, we next have Living Room. Living Room comes from the Nintendog series, serving as a general stage for the wide variety of games in that lineup. Like the name suggests, this stage takes place on the long, flat floor of a living room, more specifically the country home from Nintendogs plus Cats on 3DS. 
Throughout the battle, building blocks and various toys will fall from the top of the stage, potentially hitting players, and stacking into different layouts and structures. These blocks and toys come from the various toys that dogs and cats can play with during actual Nintendogs gameplay. The background of the stage will also have a random dog or cat playing around. This animal can either be a beagle, a toy poodle, a Jack Russell, a golden retriever, a Shiba Inu, or a calico kitten. There is also a retro TV in the background that, by default, displays an image of animals wearing Mario and Luigi hats. The background pet can sit and watch this TV, and the images will then cycle through other images of animals wearing Mario series hats. All of these images are taken from actual Nintendogs games. The next stage in Smash for 3DS is known as Street Pass Legend in Japan, Street Pass Quest in PAL regions, or simply Find Me in North America. This stage is inspired by the game Inside Street Pass Me Plaza, an application that came standard on the 3DS. With Street Pass, a 3DS in sleep mode could exchange Miis with other 3DSs in sleep mode, where you could essentially collect other people's Miis that you've passed by out in the real world. In Find Me, you could use these different Miis to rescue the player's Mii, who has been kidnapped by monsters. After beating Find Me, the player unlocks Find Me 2, in which the player's Mii is captured again along with their family. The true final boss of Find Me 2 is the Dark Lord's upgraded form, the Dark Emperor fought at the Castle of Darkness. This setting and boss fight are the basis for the stage in Smash. A caged Mii can be seen swinging on the left side of the stage, representing the kidnap of the Mii in Find Me, with the cage itself even matching. This cage can be attacked and is pretty sturdy, making it a sort of swinging platform. However, it can eventually be destroyed, sending the Mii flying off in the distance. The Mii inside the cage is chosen at random from the saved Miis that are found on the 3DS or Switch system. The Dark Emperor will hang out in the background, performing a couple of different attacks. First, he can make either of the two platforms lower, forcing everyone to fight on the one that remains. More notably, though, is his ability to change the power of players' attack, defense, specials, speed, or all of the above, either positively or negatively. The way this is determined varies depending on the version of the game you're playing. In Smash for 3DS, the Dark Emperor will randomly pick one of the 12 Mii colors and impact all of the characters on screen whose costume is the same color as what he selected. In Smash Ultimate, this mechanic was scrapped, and the Dark Emperor will instead simply pick characters completely at random, meaning that one, some, all, or no characters can be chosen. The Dark Emperor can also jump in the foreground and physically attack as well. When this happens, players can also attack him back, and if he's defeated, the player that dealt the final blow will be given a temporary stat boost. Kind of a cool stage based on a mini-game inside of an app that's pre-installed on your 3DS system. Next, let's talk about Tomodachi Life. Tomodachi Life is another Mii-focused game, this time in the life simulation genre where the player follows and decides the interactions between various Mii's on their system, from basic tasks to more long-term decisions like marriage. The core gameplay takes place in various rooms throughout an apartment complex, and this apartment complex is the basis for the stage in Smash. As an actual stage, the layout is fairly basic, with three inner floors of the building and the roof, ultimately comprising four levels that players can fight on. The bigger feature of this stage is the rooms inside of the building, which are only visible through the outer wall when a character is occupying the same space, kind of like the quirk of the Luigi's Mansion stage. For Tomodachi Life, the rooms inside are always randomized. There are 12 possible rooms that can be selected, with six being picked every time the stage is loaded. Each room inside is effectively pulled straight from Tomodachi Life, just with items rearranged so that the room is visible to the player. These rooms range from realistic looking living rooms to a room that looks like a boxing ring or a beach. Inside of these rooms we can see Mii's, obviously referencing Mii's living inside of the apartment complex. One of these Mii's will always be the system's primary Mii, while the rest will be randomly selected from the other Mii's on the system. All of these Mii's can be wearing clothing that exists in Tomodachi Life. Four unisex outfits, eight exclusive to male Mii's, and eight exclusive to female Mii's. There aren't really any references for these, they're just kind of different categories of outfits that you might find in the real world that are also found in Tomodachi Life. But I figured it was worth a mention. Lastly, in the background of the stage, we can see the amusement park off in the distance, which is one of the unlockable activities found in the game. Our next stage is the rare example of a sequel stage in Picto Chat 2. Like the first PictoChat in Brawl, this is inspired by the PictoChat application introduced on the Nintendo DS. It focuses on the drawing aspect, with each new drawing impacting the stage and gameplay in some way. All of the drawings for PictoChat 2 are completely new, and many of these are Smash originals that are simply creative ideas but otherwise have no reference. There are 26 different drawings this time, and like before, I won't bore you with all of the details on each one. However, there are a few that do indeed reference other games. First, we have the Donkey Kong drawing. 
This one features a crude sketch of the first level of Donkey Kong, including the big guy himself. DK will throw sketches of barrels down, which will follow the drawn ramps, simulating the gameplay of the arcade game. Another drawing replicates a segment found in Super Mario Bros. World 1-2. Platforms move up or down on either side with a row of bricks in the center, just like in that level. Next is a drawing that puts a bunch of Pac-Mans... Pac-Men? onto the stage, damaging players on knockback. Sakurai revealed in a Miiverse Pick of the Day post that this specifically references Pac-Pigs, a 2005 Nintendo DS game that required the player to draw their own Pac-Men to complete each level. So it's a nice little reference to multiple games that revolve around drawing functionality. Finally, we have a section with a ton of pipes, similar to those in Mario. Interacting with this pipe will suck the player in and have them appear at another random pipe, functionally similar to Mario pipes, as well as the pipes way back on Mushroom Kingdom in Smash 64. And we're finally at the last Smash for 3DS exclusive stage, Pac Maze. The origin for this stage is pretty obvious, the mazes that Pac-Man needs to traverse through in the very first Pac-Man arcade game. The goal of each level is to eat every dot while avoiding the four different colored ghosts. A power pellet, one of the bigger dots, can be eaten in order to turn the ghosts into flashing blue and white forms, which Pac-Man can then eat. Overall, this stage is a decent tribute to these original levels, though many liberties have to be taken in order to make it a playable Smash stage. There are a couple of solid platforms that are based on the walls of the maze, while the soft platforms with white lines are based on the room and door that the four ghosts come from. And speaking of ghosts, Blinky, Inky, Pinky, and Clyde all appear on this stage as hazards, naturally dealing damage and knockback to anyone who hits them. Dots also appear on this stage, with a special per-player mechanic. Fighters can collect these pellets, and when they collect 100, their own special power pellet can appear, indicated by a matching color pointer above it. That player can collect it and will receive a boost to their attack power for a short while. Enemy players can attack opposing power pellets, which will grant them 20 points, and of course eliminate the chance of that player getting their stat boost. Neutral power pellets can also appear, with anyone capable of grabbing and using them. Bonus Fruit can also occasionally appear, which is worth 10 points. Bonus Fruit appeared in the Pac-Man arcade games, giving bonus points if the player can eat it. Collecting the big power pellets will also make the four ghosts turn into their flashing blue forms, and if the powered up player collides with them, they will disappear and their eyes will flee, just like in Pac-Man. Interestingly, only the powered up player will see the blue ghosts. Everyone else will see the regular ghosts and can still be damaged by them, which is an almost unique experience that only playing on multiple 3DS consoles could offer. Defeating the blue ghosts will result in a point value appearing. 200, 400, 800, and 1600. The same points yielded if all four were eaten in Pac-Man. This stage would unfortunately not see a return in Ultimate, leaving it as an exclusive to Smash for 3DS. The first new stage found in Smash for Wii U is Big Battlefield. Revealed in the Smash for Wii U 50 Fact Extravaganza Direct, this stage is an offshoot of standard Battlefield designed for the newly introduced 8-player Smash mode, offering plenty of room for everyone. In Wii U, 8-player Smash was only compatible with certain stages, so it was nice to have a stage specifically designed for it. The design of the stage is literally just Battlefield but bigger, and with extra platforms, so it has the exact same Smash original origin. And naturally, in Smash 4, Big Battlefield matches that version of Battlefield, and likewise, the same is true for Smash Ultimate. Next is our first new Mario stage for this game, Mushroom Kingdom U, based on New Super Mario Bros. U. This is a transforming stage, with Kamek the Magic Koopa appearing periodically and using his magic to change the stage into multiple different locations from the game. The stage always starts out on a grassland form, based on Acorn Plains, the first world of Mario U. The second form is based on the game's sixth world, Rock Candy Mines. Then, a layout based on Merengue Clouds, the game's seventh world. And finally, the inside of Slide Lift Tower, the tower level found in Merengue Clouds, which features similarly moving platforms. While only three worlds are represented in actual appearance, elements from other worlds can also appear. Geysers can shoot up from the bottom that act as platforms, and occasionally they will have big urchins on them, which serve as a damaging hazard. These come from the third world of the game, Sparkling Waters. Giant icicles can also drop from above, originating from Frosted Glacier, the fourth world. If a player is struck while falling, these icicles will freeze them. Once they land, they serve as additional slippery platforms and can be destroyed destroyed by attacks. Beanstalks can also appear on the stage, sprouting leaves that serve as extra platforms, based on their appearance in a level of the Sparkling Waters world. Alongside all of this, Nabbit can appear at random to interfere with the battle. Nabbit is a small purple rabbit introduced in New Super Mario Bros. U. Originally, he served as a thief, stealing items from toad houses. Mario would have to chase him in a previously played level and grab him in order to recover these items. Later on, he would appear in New Super Luigi U, performing the same function but also acting as a playable character. In 
Smash, Nabbit will appear with his big sack and attempt to catch fighters in it. If successful, he will then run off and fly towards the top of the screen in an attempt to KO that player, though they can attempt to escape by mashing. Nabbit can also be attacked as though he were a fighter, which is honestly kind of what he deserves for attempted kidnap and murder. Staying in the realm of Mario games, we next have the Mario Galaxy stage, obviously based on Super Mario Galaxy. The core of this stage is built off of Gateway Galaxy, the first planet that Mario finds himself on at the beginning of the game. This stage is unique in that, rather than being perfectly even, it implements a gravity mechanic based off of the one in Mario Galaxy. In that game, each planet had its own gravitational pull, keeping Mario on the surface no matter what the orientation of the planet. The curvature of this stage reflects that, with the gravity pulling fighters to the planet's center of gravity. As a result, projectiles can behave strangely. Some will act as you might expect, also following the curve of the planet, like Rob's laser. However, others will not follow gravity and will stay oriented with its fighter rather than the planet, kind of like Fox's lasers, so they just go flying outwards. The house in the background is the same one found on Gateway Galaxy. In the background, we can see a variety of spacecraft that are found in both Mario Galaxy games. There are Bowser's airships, which were used throughout Galaxy 1 in both the opening of the game as well as in certain levels. There's also Starship Mario, the main hub of Galaxy 2, piloted by Lubba. This ship was the means of traveling to different galaxies in lieu of the Comet Observatory. Finally, we can see the Star Shroom, the Toad Brigade spacecraft found in both games. The Toad Brigade is a team of Toads that explore space and assist Mario, led by Captain Toad. This stage is largely untouched in the jump to Ultimate, however one point of interest is the mini-map that is new to this game, reflecting the curvature unique to this stage. Next up, we have yet another stage with a repeat name, Mario Circuit, specifically the version from Mario Kart 8. Like other Mario Kart stages before it, this stage will follow the course of the track on a floating platform, stopping at various spots throughout the race, allowing the racers to potentially hit the fighters. However, this stage has a unique quirk that sets it apart from the other Mario Kart stages, anti-gravity. This was a new mechanic introduced in Mario Kart 8, allowing for courses that saw racers capable of driving on walls or upside down, sticking to the racetrack through anti-gravity tech. To honor this new mechanic, Mario Circuit keeps the fighters oriented the same way, showing off how the drivers of this course use the anti-gravity. There are segments where racers are driving normally, but also on the sides of walls or even completely upside down. This also means that the track can also serve as walls or a ceiling, making it impossible for players to be KO'd in those directions. The main fighting platform also seems to use technology similar to the anti-gravity found on the carts. As you may have guessed, the racers on this stage are once again Shy Guys, referencing the download play feature in prior Mario Kart games, allowing you to play local multiplayer with a friend without actually owning the game, but limiting you to playing as a Shy Guy. However, unlike the previous Mario Kart stages, which were actually based on games that had download play, Mario Kart 8 does not offer such a feature. However, using Shy Guys as the racers seems to have simply become a staple for Mario Kart stages in Smash, so they were likely still chosen for the sake of consistency. Next, we have the only new Donkey Kong stage for both versions of Smash 4, Jungle Hijinks, which I can't believe that's how you spell it. This stage comes to us from the revival of the Donkey Kong Country series, Donkey Kong Country Returns for the Wii. Jungle Hijinks is the name of the first level of this game, paying tribute to the first country games, whose first level was also named Jungle Hijinks. This stage is pulled directly from a segment of the level in Donkey Kong Country Returns, with some adjustments to make it more friendly as a stage in Smash. This section in the game serves as an introduction to a new mechanic to the series, allowing for gameplay in both the foreground and the background by way of barrel cannons. This is emulated pretty well in Smash. Occasionally, barrel cannons will appear on the stage, allowing a fighter to blast into the background or the foreground if they jump into them. The Smash stage implements a few additional details to make this a more engaging stage to fight on and to prevent camping. After a player launches from a barrel cannon, they will have a weird orange smoke effect around them for a short time. If they jump into another barrel cannon while the smoke is around them, the barrel will instead explode. This is designed to keep players from just running away, jumping into barrel after barrel to avoid any fighting. Occasionally, the main platform in the foreground will lower, revealing a number of cannons, forcing the fight to take place in the background for a short time. Any hits that take place in the background cause more knockback than usual as a way to compensate for the blast zones being further away. Lastly, an enemy called a Screaming Pillar can occasionally appear in between the two sets of platforms. If a fighter launches out of a barrel from the foreground and hits the pillar, it will fall into the background, causing damage to anyone who gets hit by it. The Screaming Pillars are a part of the Tiki Tak tribe, the primary enemies in Donkey Kong Country Returns. Jungle Hijinx failed to make a return in Ultimate, leaving it as just a Smash for Wii U exclusive. Our next stage is a new Zelda one, Skyloft. 
This stage is based on Link's home in The Legend of Zelda Skyward Sword, Skyloft, also known as the Isle of the Goddess. The Earth is uninhabited by humans, with floating islands above the clouds being where they live instead. Link lives on Skyloft, and his adventure eventually takes him below the clouds to explore the Earth below. The stage consists of a primary platform that will take on different shapes throughout the course of the match. It will also travel all around Skyloft, periodically landing on different locations found on the floating island. For all intents and purposes, this seems to be the map ripped straight out of Skyward Sword and only given some minor tweaks. Most of the locations the stage takes fighters to are some of the main points of interest in Skyloft. The Knight Academy, on or in front of the Statue of the Goddess, or in front of the Bazaar, just to name a few. In the far background, we can see some of the other floating islands above the clouds. On top of this, a few background characters, for lack of a better word, can also be seen. First are Loftwings, bird creatures that play an important role in the game, serving as the means of travel above the clouds. Link receives a rare Crimson Loftwing, a reference to the red bird found on the Hylian shield, but each Skyloft resident will typically have a partner Loftwing to travel with. You can also see Beetle's air shop in the background. Beetle is a recurring character in the Zelda series, with different incarnations often running shops. This version of Beetle's store flies around Skyloft, with Link needing to ring the bell with a projectile in order to signal Beetle that he has a customer. Lastly, beacons of light can be seen breaking through the thick layer of clouds. These beams don't exist at the start of the game, but as Link gains access to areas of the surface, these beams appear to indicate an opening to each different part of the land. Next, we have one of the most infamous stages in Smash, Pyrosphere. Pyrosphere is a location found in Metroid Other M. Samus is sent here by her commander in order to track down a mystery creature that had previously attacked her. Later on in the same location, she realizes this creature is actually Ridley the Space Pirate, who she knows to have been killed before. This Ridley is in fact a clone mistakenly engineered from DNA on Samus' suit. Ridley then attacks Samus and a battle takes place in a lava-filled area. This battle is the basis for the stage in Smash, with the location and arena being pretty much exactly the same as in Other M. Much to Ridley fans' displeasure, Ridley appears here as a giant stage boss. He can attack by flying at high speed using his claws and tail and breathing fire. He can even absorb the energy from the tanks beneath the stage, increasing his strength. Fighters can attack him, and after enough damage is dealt, whoever exceeds the damage limit with their final attack gains Ridley as an ally, who will attack all others on the stage. This clone Ridley is a big point of focus in Other M. The game shows us the life cycle of Ridley and presumably his species, with it starting as a form known as Little Birdie before shedding to become the mystery creature form and ultimately a fully mature adult Ridley. Other minor enemies will appear on this stage as well. FG2 Grams are turrets that will fire beams when hit. Julians are strange alien creatures that will inflate and explode when they receive damage. Finally, Zeros will appear, which are harmless on their own. However, they can be picked up, increasing a fighter's weight, and thrown to deal damage. While Zeros have appeared multiple times since Super Metroid, both FG2 Grams and Julians were first introduced in Metroid Other M. Pyrosphere missed out on returning in Smash Ultimate, likely because Ridley was promoted from boss character to, finally, a playable fighter. Next, we have a brand new Yoshi stage known simply as Woolly World. This stage matches the fabric aesthetic of Yoshi's Woolly World for the Wii U. Interestingly, this stage was revealed to be a rather late addition to Smash for Wii U, and its inclusion in Smash actually predates its Game of Origins release. Smash released in winter 2014, while Woolly World wasn't until summer 2015. The stage begins on a form that resembles a basic grassland, with several windmills in the background. This comes from World 1-5 of Woolly World, Nitty Naughty Windmill Hill. There are platforms that hang down on the stage in the form of a mobile, which is taken from World 3 2, Wobble Mobile John. Eventually, the platforms rise into the sky, serving as the only ground to walk on. After a bit, the mobile will lower again into a new area, which looks to be made of fabric toy blocks. This itself doesn't really come from anywhere, and it sort of just encapsulates the artistic style that Woolly World has overall. The mobile raises one more time into the sky before bringing the fight back down to the windmill area, starting the transitions from the beginning again. As you can see, this stage really doesn't have a ton going on in the reference department. But honestly, I think that makes sense. The stage was added late in development, whether via Sakurai's decision or at the request from Nintendo. And since the game wasn't even out yet, it's understandable that they really didn't have a ton of source material to reference and just needed to get the stage done as quickly as possible. Woolly World also did not return in the jump from Smash 4 to Ultimate. Our next stage is the biggest stage in all of Smash history, the Great Cave Offensive. 
This is an incredibly complex stage, with tons of platforms, small alcoves, and hazards all over the place. Additionally, if the fighters are even spread out moderately, they become incredibly small and very difficult to see. The Great Cave Offensive is one of the game modes in both Kirby Superstar and its remake, Superstar Ultra. Kirby falls down a pit and finds himself in a giant cave, and the goal of the game is to find the exit and collect treasure. There are four different stages in this mode, Subtree, Crystal, Old Tower, and Garden. Each of these stages are interconnected, with Kirby able to freely travel to and from each one. The stage in Smash takes the four stages found in this mode and jams them all together, with each stage represented by a section of the stage. Subtree on top, Crystal on the right, Old Tower in the center, and Garden on the left. Treasure chests can periodically appear during the fight, supplying players who attack them with items or, sometimes, a sabotaging explosion. Lava and spikes can be found peppered throughout the stage, referencing some of the hazards that can be found in the original game mode. Spikes simply damage and knock back opponents, while lava will instantly KO any opponent above 100%. Cannons can likewise be found on both this stage and the Kirby mode. Minecarts will also occasionally spawn and will launch forward if a player enters them, potentially damaging opponents. Minecarts are the method of getting from area to area in the Great Cape Offensive, so this is a nice reference in the stage. Despite this stage kind of being frustrating to play on, I actually really liked the way that Smash took this game mode and cleverly made a stage representing all of the different areas and mechanics. You just need an incredibly strong prescription to be able to see all of this stuff. The only new Star Fox stage in both versions of Smash 4 is Orbital Gate Assault. Rather than being the name of a location, the name of this stage describes the events that take place in it and, by extension, the game of origin. In the 8th mission of Star Fox Assault for the GameCube, the Aperoid race launches an assault on the Beltino Orbital Gate with many missiles, and Star Fox and Star Wolf both team up to defend the gate and their homeworld of Corneria. The stage in Smash loosely recreates the events of this battle. The fight begins atop the Great Fox out in space, with some R-Wings flying nearby. Eventually, the Great Fox flies away, resulting in the fight now taking place on top of these previously mentioned R-Wings, as well as an Aperoid missile. The missile then crashes into the Orbital Gate's force field before eventually being destroyed by three R-Wing. These R-Wing then become where the fight takes place, flying throughout the gate and the space battle overall. Eventually, they drop the fighters off at the second Aperoid missile, which will again attempt to break through the force field before being destroyed. R-Wing pick the players up again and take them back to the Great Fox, where the stage loop will begin once again. Sakurai revealed in a Miiverse post that this single stage actually took an entire year to complete, which is crazy. Though, I guess it does make sense, because there's a ton going on with this stage. Unfortunately though, this stage would not see a return in Smash Ultimate, leaving all that work exclusive to the Wii U. Next, we have a brand new Pokemon stage, Kalos Pokemon League. This is naturally from the location where the player takes on the Elite Four in the Kalos region, the setting of Pokemon X and Y, the sixth generation. The main form of the stage is based on the main hall of the Pokemon League, which has five sets of doors, one for each of the Elite Four, and a final for the champion. The player is able to confront the Elite Four in any order that they wish, with each having a room themed around their typing. While the main hall in X and Y is rather basic, just with the big stained glass window as the focal point, the Stage form in Smash really takes this window and extrapolates it, offering more decorative windows and making the area much, much bigger. This stage also emulates the concept of the Elite Four in X and Y's Pokemon League. Each Elite Four member has their own special room leading off the main hall, but the style of the room is similar to the main hall. Instead of having you travel to each room, the stage instead transforms into a form that matches the typing and rooms from X and Y. Additionally, both hazards and background Pokemon will appear that correspond to the room's typing. The first transformation turns the stage into the blade Blazing Chamber, representing the Fire-type Elite Four member, Malva. Her room has giant pillars of fire that blast out when you enter. Smash has taken this and placed platforms on top, letting you stand at the top of these pillars, but you can still take damage from the actual fire underneath. The background Pokémon that appear are all fire types to match with Malva's team. Infernape, Tepig, and Blaziken all appear, representing multiple generations of fire-type starters. Pyroar also appears, the only 6th generation Pokémon here, and also the only one of these Pokémon to appear on Malva's team. Though interestingly, Smash uses a male Pyroar, while Malva's Pyroar is female. Each chamber also has a 20% chance to spawn a legendary Pokémon, which will match the typing of the chosen chamber and have an additional effect on the stage. For the Blazing Chamber, Ho-Oh has a chance to appear. Ho-Oh will cause the pillars of fire on the stage to burn with more intensity, resulting in the platforms going up much higher and the fire much more of a hazard. 
The next transformation is the Flood Chamber, representing the water type Elite Four member, Seabolt. In X and Y, there are two gears held up by chains, and the room floods with water when the player enters. This is sort of used in Smash, but it has its own spin on it. These gears are now turned into more solid platforms for fighters. Rather than having the whole area flooded with water, ramps will appear on the left and right side, and periodically, water will rush down across the entire stage, with the chance of fighters being pulled in the current. The background Pokémon are Piplup and Blastoise, two water type starters, Wailord, who is honestly there probably because it's just funny to see that big of a Pokemon, and Clawitzer. Clawitzer debuted in Generation 6 of Pokemon and is also on Seabolt's team. The legendary Pokemon for the Flood Chamber is Manaphy. Manaphy will turn the stage into a giant drain, using Whirlpool to cause water to spin down towards the center, pulling players in and potentially KOing them. The third transformation is the Ironworks Chamber, for Steel-type Elite Four member Wickstrong. As you enter this chamber, two giant swords fall from the ceiling and slowly enter into slots on the floor. In Smash, these same swords appear, though they function differently. They'll start out entering into the slots, but they will stay about halfway inserted with the hilt serving as platforms. The blades are constantly active hitboxes, so touching them results in damage and knockback. If hit with attacks, however, these swords will slowly lower into the slots, bringing the platforms down to ground level. A liquid metal puddle also appears in the center periodically, which will turn any fighter who touches it into a metal fighter, which obviously makes sense for the Steel-type form. The background Pokémon are Steelix and Scizor, two of the first new Steel-type evolutions of pre-existing Pokémon, Clink Clang, and Honedge. Honedge is a new Generation 6 Pokémon and is the first stage of what eventually evolves into Aegislash. Aegislash, as well as the previously mentioned Scizor, are both members of Wickstrom's team. The legendary Pokémon for the Ironworks Chamber is Registeel. Registeel will use Stomp on the stage, which will cause the swords to leave the slots and spin around, potentially hitting players, before resheathing. The final transformation for the stage is the Dragon Mark Chamber, representing the Dragon-type Elite Four member, Drazna. A giant statue moves upon entering her chamber, and Smash takes this statue and adds even more to it. Periodically, the statue will roar, which will cause purple flames to appear on the stage, damaging anyone who touches it. The background Pokémon are Dragonite, Garchomp, Hydreigon, and Axew. The former three represent pseudo-legendary Dragon-type Pokémon from their respective generations. Pseudo-legendaries are Pokémon which are stronger and somewhat rarer than most other their Pokémon, but still more common than Legendaries. And Axew's probably just there because it's cute. Ironically, none of these Dragon-type Pokémon are actually used on Drasna's team. And the final Legendary Pokémon that can appear is Rayquaza. Rather than chilling in the center like the other Legendaries, Rayquaza will fly across the screen, indicated by a wave of electricity, serving as a dangerous hazard. This Legendary is also unique in that it's actually repurposed content, as Rayquaza was a boss from the Subspace Emissary mode in Brawl, and this attack is pretty much exactly the same as one of its attacks during that battle. Alright, so after that incredibly long-winded stage, we have a short one now. Colosseum, or Arena in Japanese, from the Fire Emblem series. Unsurprisingly, this stage takes place in a Colosseum, or Arena, with a huge crowd of onlookers cheering on the fight down below. Throughout the fight, the main ground that's fought on will rise into a variety of different platform configurations. This mechanical ground platform concept is pretty much Smash original, designed to provide a quote-unquote in-universe explanation for these platforms changing up. However, the Fire Emblem series is no stranger to Colosseums and Arenas, having existed since the very first Fire Emblem game and in a majority of the games across the entire series. Players can wager some gold to enter the arena in hopes of winning and receiving both experience and more gold than they bet. However, utilizing arenas runs the risk of your unit dying, resulting in both the loss of the wagered gold and the loss of that unit for the rest of the game. Design-wise, the stage's inspiration was likely sparked from the appearance of arenas in Fire Emblem Shadow Dragon, though Smash took a rather generic design and made it more intricate. Our next stage is Flat Zone X, a new stage that is both new and completely recycled. Flat Zone X takes the previous Game & Watch stages of Flat Zone and Flat Zone 2 and completely smushes them together into one single stage. Since Flat Zone 1 was just a single stage layout, really this is just adding the one Flat Zone 1 transformation into Flat Zone 2. So now, among all of the Game & Watch games represented in Flat Zone 2, Helmet is added to that lineup. Either way, this stage is quite literally exactly the same outside of that. The layouts, have hazards, references, all stay exactly the same. Despite this though, I think it's incredibly unique to take two stages of similar concepts and combine them into one ultimate stage. It would kind of be like taking Stadium 1 and Stadium 2 and combining all of those different transformations onto a single Pokemon Stadium X. I just think it's neat. Our next stage is another one of the absolute big boys in the game, Palutena's Temple. 
Palutena's temple has been a regular point of interest in the Kid Icarus series, however, like most things in Smash, the appearance of this stage takes its cues from Kid Icarus Uprising, the soft reboot of the series. During the events of chapters 19 and 20 of Kid Icarus Uprising, Palutena gets possessed by the Chaos Kin, and as a result, Sky World gets destroyed. This destruction is the inspiration for the presentation of this stage, since it doesn't really look like a very majestic or put-together temple by any definition. The stage is so big that it's effectively split into multiple smaller sections. An area made up of lots of platforms, a watery area with a fountain, what appears to be dungeons that are presumably supposed to be beneath the temple, and a cliffside that's been ripped out of a mountain with water spilling down the middle. A bridge also connects the two halves of the stage, and it can be attacked and broken. Overall, this stage is largely Smash original. Like I said, it does take design beats from the Kid Icarus series, but none of this really mirrors anything from Uprising too well. We can, though, see the giant statue of Palutena in the background, indicating that this is indeed her temple, similar to the statue in the background of the stage literally named Skyworld. Next up, we have the most gamer stage of all. Gamer comes from a minigame of the same name in Game & Wario, a spin-off of the WarioWare series for the Wii U. In this game, 9V and 18V are competing in a new game, with 9V getting the highest score. 5V then takes the game and tells them to do their homework, and when they finish, they discover that she now has the new high score. Determined to beat her score, 9V secretly stays up past his bedtime and plays in his room. 5V will continually check on 9V, so the player needs to hide and pause the game so that they don't get caught. She can open the door, walk by the window, or even pop out of the TV to catch him playing. The stage itself takes place on 9 volts desk in the bedroom from the minigame, however the layout is randomized each time you load the stage. Books and wooden blocks will make up a majority of the platforms in each layout. Pioro and its clay platform, the building from Mona's game Shutter, or a sketchbook can all occasionally appear in different forms. The hiding from mom element is the basis for the stage's main mechanic. 5V can appear in any of the ways that she does in Game & Wario. Additionally, she has a couple of Smash original ways as well. She can appear out of the sketchbook or the gamepad, which will only appear in certain layouts of the stage. When 5V appears, a beam of light will shoot from her eyes, indicating her field of vision. Any players caught in this light will face her motherly wrath and receive damage, a brief stun, and high knockback. Lastly, as a fun easter egg, a Virtual Boy can be seen next to the TV. The Virtual Boy is a failed Nintendo console, the first in their attempt at 3D gaming. This Virtual Boy is also visible in 9V's bedroom in Game & Wario. Our next stage is a brand new one from the Pikmin series, Garden of Hope. This location is one found in Pikmin 3 for the Wii U, being one of the earliest areas visited, where Alf must rescue Brittany. However, the stage in Smash is actually based on an area of the Garden of Hope that is only accessible on the second visit in the game, only possible after defeating the Scornet Maestro and rescuing Louie. Much of the level is pretty faithful to its appearance in Pikmin 3, though Smash does do some rearranging for the benefit of the fight. A breakable bowl and bridge are both found on this stage, and after a while, some Pikmin will appear to rebuild them, based on their ability to do so in Pikmin 3. A peckish aristocrat, an enemy that can be found in the Garden of Hope, can also enter the foreground of the stage as a big boy hazard, damaging players who are hit and destroying some of the terrain. A bulborb enemy can also hang out in the background. Interestingly, while the bulborb won't interfere with the fighters directly, stage Pikmin will not appear until the bulborb goes away, which is a neat nod to bulborbs being a natural predator of Pikmin. This means that while the bulborb is present on the stage, any of the elements broken by player attacks will not be repaired until it leaves. Next, we have a new Animal Crossing stage, Town and City. This stage is based on the mechanics of Animal Crossing City Folk, where there exists both a town and a city. The town is where the player and other villagers live, with some smaller shops and establishments found throughout. However, the player can visit the city by riding the bus, where they can go to other bigger shops found in the central plaza. The main platform of the town and city stage will travel back and forth between a town background and a city background, representing the traveling back and forth in City Folk. The platform layouts are different for each area, but both sides will always have a bus stop sign, representing the usage of the bus to get to and from the town and city. In the town, we can see the player and villager houses as they appear in City Folk, as well as different notable points of interest. The Able Sisters shop, fountain, museum, nook's cranny, town gate, and town hall are all visible. Moving to the city, we can see the auction house, Gracie Grace, Happy Room Academy, Marquee, and Shampoodle shops all in the plaza. Just like with Smashville, many background characters can appear on this stage. 
However, unlike on Smashville, all of these characters are special characters in the game, meaning they aren't villagers, but rather unique NPCs that serve a specific function in Animal Crossing. These are the characters that can randomly appear on the town half, these are the characters that can randomly appear on the city half, and these are the characters who can appear on either. All of these make for a grand total of 40 background characters that can appear. Other elements from Smashville are carried over to town and city. A balloon can appear, carrying a piece of food if items are on. The stage also syncs up with the system clock, changing the lighting depending on the time of day, exactly the same way Smashville functions. Certain shops will also be open or closed depending on the time of day. Additionally, KK Slider will also appear on Saturday nights between 8pm and 12am, just as he does in Smashville, playing tracks that are ripped straight from Animal Crossing. Next up, we have a stage repping a brand new series, We Fit Studio. This stage is a pretty liberal interpretation of the studio as it appears in the Wii Fit series. Ordinarily, this is a rather small room that features a trainer instructing the movements and a mirror in the background. This idea has been scaled up to be the size of the entire stage, with the room and mirror being like 10 times larger. Exercise equipment that could be seen in Wii Fit sits in the background of the stage, and the balance board also makes an appearance. On top of being physically used in Wii Fit, the balance board was also an animated little guy, and Smash carries that over as well. All of the platforms on this stage are also balance boards, extended further than normal to offer more room to battle. Occasionally, the mirror will disappear and a yoga pose will be shown, sort of being the replacement for the instructor. In the Jump to Ultimate, silhouetted people can be seen using the exercise equipment or doing stretches, based on similar silhouettes found throughout the Wii Fit series. Overall, the Smash team just took the idea of a workout room led by an instructor and kinda just did whatever they felt like. Next up, we have a super throwback stage, Wrecking Crew, based on the NES and Famicom game of the exact same name. This stage is a modernized take on the NES game, implementing mechanics from it into Smash's gameplay. In Wrecking Crew, Mario and Luigi were tasked with using a hammer to destroy walls in each level, avoiding enemies as they go. There are also bombs, which can be attacked in order to explode many walls at once. Barrels can fall on the enemies in the game, trapping them inside. A lot of this is carried over pretty faithfully into Smash. The stage has a ground floor and and four additional floors above it. While standard attacks cannot break the stone walls, bombs are all over the place, which will explode when attacked, which will cause the walls to break. In Wrecking Crew, support beams can be destroyed in order to cause the barrels to drop on top of enemies. This mechanic has been taken further in Smash. When enough walls are destroyed on a floor, the floor above it loses its support, and it will cause every road to collapse down one level. This is how barrels can be used to trap fighters, who can either mash to get out or simply get hit by an opponent's attack. Entire floors collapsing doesn't exist in Wrecking Crew, just the ability to drop barrels, so this cascading damage is unique to Smash. There are an infinite number of randomly generated floors on this stage, so you could play for literally an hour and you would never run out. Moving to another fairly unique stage, let's talk about Pilot Wings. Pilot Wings is a small series of flight simulation games developed and released by Nintendo, with three entries total Pilot Wings for the SNES, Pilot Wings 64, and Pilot Wings Resort for the 3DS. The stage in Smash combines elements from both the SNES and 3DS games. The beginning of the stage sees players fighting on top of a red biplane flying through point rings, based on the plane found in the first Pilot Wings. While fighting on this plane, the scenery below is that of a flat 2D island. The flat island moving around in a 3D space is pulled straight from the SNES game, which utilized the Mode 7 technology for that console, which simulated 3D movement by manipulating two-dimensional textures. After a while, the fighters will be dropped off the red plane onto a yellow plane, coming from the planes used in Pilot Wings Resort. The design of the point rings is also updated to mirror the ones from Pilot Wings 64 and Resort. Pilot Wings Resort took place in an area known as Woohoo Island and allowed players to fly around this island area in the gameplay. At the time, Woohoo Island was a recurring location found in Nintendo games. The island debuted in Wii Fit under the name Wii Fit Island before its more notable appearance and name change in Wii Sports Resort. It also appeared in Mario Kart 7 as a playable raceway. When the fighters are on this yellow plane, the background changes to the three-dimensional Woohoo Island, referencing the new setting for the game on 3DS. Throughout this part of the stage, Miis can be seen with rocket belts in the background, referencing gameplay from Pilot Wings Resort, though the actual rocket belt first appeared in the original Pilot Wings. And finally, the yellow plane will trade off with a red plane, starting the cycle of the stage over, taking you back to the original Pilot Wings for SNES. And speaking of Woohoo Island, this area is also its own, separate stage in Smash for Wii U. Similar to other stages, platforms will take you to different locations on the island, each with some unique elements. The first location is the Frisbee Dog Park, where a Mii can be seen throwing a frisbee for his dog to catch, 
based on one of the sports available in Wii Sports Resort. Next is the Swaying Bridge, which is a side perspective on one of the stages found in Swordplay Showdown, also in Wii Sports Resort. Then we have the Speedboat. The design of this boat seems to be Smash original, though boating is fairly common in Resort, such as in the wakeboarding sport. Next we have a large group of rocks at sea, largely an original idea just taken from the ocean found around Wuhu Island. And then we have Maka Wuhu, which is the name of the volcano that's found on Wuhu Island. This is the highest point in the entire island and can be virtually seen from anywhere, often seen in the background of many of the sports being played. We then have a boating gate, which indicates the starting point for the power cruising sport. As a result, Mies can be seen power cruising through this gate during the midst of the fight. Then we have the Wishing Fountain, which is a location in the southern end of Wuhu Island, found at the center of the town there. Next is the Swordplay Coliseum, which is naturally a location where the Swordplay Duel Sport can take place. And lastly, we have Talon Rock, another location found around Wuhu Island. Throughout the battle, Mies can be seen performing sports, doing leisure activities, or just spectating. This is one of the rare instances where Mies seen on stages are not taken from the console saved Mies. Instead, they're simply generated based on a set of pre-made Mies, and the stage will always use these, though their appearances may be random. Finally, as a neat detail, the yellow plane from Pilot Wings can be seen in the background of this stage, linking the last two stages together, as well as Woohoo Island's presence in both original games. Our next stage is a brand new Sonic stage known as Windy Hill Zone. Windy Hill Zone is the first zone of Sonic Lost World, a formerly Nintendo exclusive Sonic game that was released between the releases of Brawl and Smash 4. Design-wise, Windy Hill is reminiscent of Green Hill Zone in its patterns and overall design, however it also has new elements to separate the two as well. The gameplay of Lost World finds Sonic running on giant cylindrical levels, able to rotate across the entire thing, kind of like a Sonic version of the concept in Super Mario Galaxy. To that end, the stage in Smash is similar to the Mario Galaxy stage as well, being a curved stage that has a gravity mechanic rather than a completely parallel one. Many of the elements are pulled from the actual Windy Hill Zone, including springs and the windmill. The springs can be a bit of a gamble with the gravity mechanic, as they won't fire you straight up relative to the screen, but will send you at a sort of odd angle. This is still helpful for recovery, but can be devastating if you aren't careful. The windmill has platforms attached to it, following the rotation of the blades. On the stage, there are also animal friends that make an appearance. These have been a recurring element since the very first Sonic game, where Eggman captured them and essentially enslaved them to power his robot minions. They make a return in Sonic Lost World, with their designs in that game being represented here in Smash. Our next stage is the other Pac-Man series stage in the Smash series, Pac-Land. Pac-Land is an arcade game released in 1984. Pac-Man's goal in this game is to traverse side-scrolling levels and return a lost fairy back to Fairyland before ultimately returning home to his family. Inky, Pinky, Blinky, Clyde, and Sue are all enemies that can be encountered in the game, attempting to impede Pac-Man's journey. Power pellets are also featured, turning the ghosts blue like in the arcade game and allowing Pac-Man to eat them for points. Pac-Man travels through all kinds of terrain during each stage, such as cities, jungles, and deserts. The stages found in Pac-Land are pulled straight from the game and placed into Smash to serve as the stage. In the arcade game, the scrolling of the stage follows Pac-Man, while in Smash, Pac-Land automatically scrolls throughout each level. While the enemy ghosts are removed for Smash, most of the other hazards are retained. Fire hydrants pushing players, collapsing parts of a bridge, and water spouts are some of the hazards that are yanked straight from the arcade game. The stage starts out at Pac-Man's house, then scrolls through a city, a forest, and a bridge above water. Once it reaches the end, the players all end up in Fairyland, simulating the end of the arcade level. Mother Fairy appears here and will grant a player wing shoes, one of the rewards offered in Pac-Land. In both games, the wing shoes boost the player's jumping ability. After this segment, the stage scrolls right to left. The return trip takes place in a desert, then a canyon, and a lake, before returning to town and then Pac-Man's house. When returning to the house, Miss Pac-Man can be seen, greeting her husband after his long journey. In the Japanese version of Pac-Land, Miss Pac-Man has the exact same appearance as in Smash, which is now her concrete design. However, in international versions of Pac-Land, she looked quite different, instead being based on artwork done for previous Pac-Man arcade cabinets. In both versions, she's joined by Baby Pac-Man, who is noticeably missing in Smash. The stage then loops in the exact same way, however the lighting will instead have the stage take place at sunset. After another complete loop, the stage will then take place at nighttime. The arcade game also features different lighting, however the actual layouts for the stages would see small changes as well, while in Smash it stays the same.
Our next stage is one of the first new ones added in an update to Smash for Wii U, Miiverse. Miiverse is a social service offered by Nintendo back on the Wii U and 3DS. It was essentially a web forum that allowed users to post about different topics, such as games or characters, in subsections known as communities. The Miiverse stage was a unique one that integrated posts from the Miiverse app into the background of the stage. Every Smash character had support communities, where players could submit drawn posts that would potentially show up in the background of the stage whenever those characters were being played. On paper, this was a really fun idea. Cool drawings and supported posts cheering on all of the different fighters in Smash. On paper. But in execution... Yeah, this stage ultimately just became a bastion of memes combined with racial slurs and wiener drawings, just like pretty much everywhere on the internet. Admittedly, some of the memes and joke posts were really funny, but the stage just didn't end up being the wholesome concept that Nintendo clearly hoped it would be. You would have needed a full-time dedicated team to constantly vet the posts that would be allowed on the Smash stage, and that just isn't reasonable. In November 2017, the Miiverse network was officially shut down. As a result, Miiverse compatibility across all the different Wii U and 3DS games was no longer supported, and if you go back and play on this stage with your Wii U connected to the internet today, the stage will not load any posts in the background. Naturally, because Miiverse was no longer supported, Miiverse does not make a return in Smash Ultimate. Good night, sweet prince. And now we move on to paid DLC stages, with the first one that was ever released, Mario Maker, available on both the 3DS and Wii U. This stage is based on the game of the same name, which allowed players to create their very own Mario levels. Enemies, blocks, power-ups, coins, everything could be placed pretty much anywhere the player decided, creating some unique stages that would never have appeared in any official Super Mario game. Four different styles can be selected and changed to at any time, based on Super Mario Bros., Super Mario Bros. 3, Super Mario World, or New Super Mario Bros. U. Smash takes this concept and makes Super Mario Maker a completely randomized stage, with many possible outcomes for every single time you load into the stage. Along with the actual layout, the starting style for the stage will also be randomly selected from those available in Mario Maker, and throughout the match it will transition into another of the styles in the same way that it does in the level editor. On Smash for 3DS, it will only alternate between two of the styles, likely for performance reasons, but on Wii U and later Ultimate, it will transition through all four styles. Plenty of the more unique elements that could be used in Mario Maker levels can be generated on this stage, like ice blocks or lava appearing in unusual places, falling donut blocks, warp pipes, or conveyor belts. It's also possible for blocks and structures to be destroyed during gameplay, and periodically throughout the match, a hand holding a Wii U stylus will repair the stage back to its initial glory. This hand is the same one that would appear on screen when using the level editor in Super Mario Maker. Various Mario enemies can also appear in the background, such as Bullet Bills, Hammer Bros, or a Goomba in Bowser Jr.'s clown car. It really is hard to fully encapsulate everything about this stage, it's just a random chaotic mess at times, and honestly, I love it. That chaos really does do a good job of representing what Super Mario Maker ended up being. The next DLC stage was bundled along with Ryu, called Suzaku Castle. In Street Fighter II The World Warrior, this is Ryu's home stage, located in Japan. It takes place on a rooftop found at a Japanese temple. Being a more traditional fighting game, Suzaku Castle in the Street Fighter series is completely flat with no platforms or hazards. Overall, the stage layout is pretty original to Smash. The right side features a long, flat section, similar to the actual Street Fighter stage, but a platform above it and platforms to the left are unique, just to keep this from being a simple flat stage. There are also signposts found on this stage that can be broken when an attack is performed next to them, another detail that was based on the stage's appearance in The World Warrior. This stage has seen updates and changes in appearance in the Street Fighter series, though the 3DS and Wii U versions of the stage match its original sunset appearance. In Ultimate, the lighting has been adjusted, made to match more closely with the stage's appearance in Street Fighter V. When nearing the end of a match, either with 30 seconds remaining, a player at low stamina, or a player on their last stock, most tracks will play their critical versions, sped up versions of the song meant to hype up the final moments of the battle, a mechanic that exists in the Street Fighter series. The next DLC stage is Midgar, bundled alongside Cloud. Midgar is the first area in Final Fantasy VII, the capital city created by the Shinra Electric Power Company, split into nine different sectors. The opening of Final Fantasy VII features a big pan over the city before ultimately lowering onto the opening scene, so it's very possible that, with how iconic this opening is, that's why this location was chosen as a stage. The stage takes place on a battlefield-ish layout, matching the very steampunk style that Midgar has, with the city itself in the background. 
The biggest building that can be prominently seen is the Shinra Building, the main headquarters for the Shinra Company, which plays a fairly significant role in Final Fantasy VII's story. After a moment, a small red orb will appear on the stage. This is a summon materia, an item that allows the player to call on monsters for assistance during battle. A fighter can run into the materia and summon an ally monster who will affect the stage in some pretty considerable way. Ifrit uses Hellfire, which blasts one section of the stage with fire with enough force to move the entire stage. The player who summoned the monster will be immune to the fire. Rama uses Judgment Bolt, which electrifies the platforms, damaging and paralyzing all but the summoner, and rearranges the platforms during this time. Odin uses Zantetsuken, which slices the stage in half and really separates them, leaving a huge gap in the center for a while before pushing back together. Any player caught in the gap when it repairs itself will be crushed to death. Leviathan uses Tidal Wave, which floods the entire area up to about half of the actual platform. This water has a strong current, which pushes players to the left, either into the stage for damage, or a KO over 100%, or to the leftmost blast zone. Finally, Bahamut Zero uses Terra Flare, which destroys the city and summons an enormous pillar of light in the center of the stage, damaging all players except for the summoner. All of the summons found on this stage are, not surprisingly, available in Final Fantasy VII. The final stage in Smash 4's lifetime is none other than Umbra Clock Tower, bundled along with Bayonetta. The Umbra Clock Tower is seen in both Bayonetta and Bayonetta 2. In the opening of Bayonetta, both Bayonetta and Jean fight angels on top of this falling clock tower, using the Witch Walk ability to stay attached. In the sequel, Bayonetta is sent back in time and meets her mother, who defends the clock tower against evil forces with her fellow witches. The clock tower ultimately gets destroyed, careening off the edge of a cliff, and Bayonetta and her mother fight angels at the same time as her past self and Jean. The stage itself in Smash is fairly basic. The face of the clock tower serves as the primary platform, with smaller chunks of the tower falling and serving as smaller, soft platforms. These get rearranged into a variety of Smash original arrangements. A fun easter egg for the stage is that the clock face will match the system time of whatever console you're playing on, though it has no impact on the rest of the stage. Periodically, the stage will fall through a big purple portal that represents Umbra Witch Magic. This signifies the stage falling into Purgatorio, a parallel to the human world. While inside this dimension, Affinity and Inspired can appear in the background, as can the gigantic Fortitudo. None of these have any impact on gameplay on this stage. After a bit, the stage will enter another purple portal, returning to the human world. The first new stage in Smash Ultimate that we'll talk briefly about is the opposite of Big Battlefield introduced in Wii U, Small Battlefield, introduced randomly in version 8.1.0. Quite literally, this stage is Battlefield, but smaller, with the top platform of normal Battlefield removed and everything constrained a bit more. Visually, the stage is exactly the same as Ultimate's big and normal Battlefields, a completely Smash original concept as all previous versions have been. So now let's move on to our first in-depth stage, New Donk City Hall. New Donk City is found in the Metro Kingdom of Super Mario Odyssey, with the City Hall being the main focal point. Other skyscrapers and buildings also exist in the city, which Mario can run around on to collect moons. New Donk City is based on New York City, with the City Hall being inspired by the Empire State Building. The name of course comes from Donkey Kong, with the Mayor Pauline also doubling down on this reference, being the lady that DK kidnapped in the original arcade game. The stage starts out at the ground floor of City Hall. Eventually, it will rise to the top of the base of the building, then about halfway up the building, before ultimately reaching the very peak. The platforms will then lower you to the ground again, and the loop will start over. City Hall is really the only reference to building here. Much of the background is incredibly generic, real-life inspired buildings based on New York City, but that's pretty much it. However, an incredibly unique aspect of this stage takes place when the track playing is either Jump Up Superstar or Super Mario Bros. Ground Theme Band Performance. With either of these, the track will start exclusively with the drum beat, with the drummer being seen at the base of the building. Throughout the duration of the match, other musicians will appear on floating platforms, and when players touch them, it will add their instrument to the backing track and they will join the drummer at the base of the building. In the case of Jump Up Superstar, Pauline can also appear on floating platforms and when touched, her vocals will be added to the track as well. This feature is based on the segment of the Metro Kingdom, where Pauline tasks Mario with finding musicians to play during the New Donk City Festival, and these exact musicians are the ones that Mario recruits. Jump Up Superstar and the Mario 1 Ground theme are both songs that the band can be heard playing in Odyssey, which is why these are the songs used by the stage. This stage mechanic only appears for these two songs. 
For any other song, the band members and Pauline will not appear, and instead there will be New Donk City residents at the base of the building cheering on the fight. A couple of background elements can also be seen. At the very top of the building, the Odyssey can be seen flying, the airship that Mario and Cappy use throughout the events of Super Mario Odyssey to get to various kingdoms. It shows that 21 power moons have been captured, however, funny enough, 55 moons are required to get to Metro Kingdom in the actual game, so this is actually a kind of error. Lastly, Captain Toad can be seen at the top of City Hall. In most cases, he's just a timed event, appearing on the third loop through the stage. However, if the background track is a song originating from Captain Toad Treasure Tracker, he'll appear in this segment every time. Captain Toad appears in multiple places throughout Super Mario Odyssey, including the Metro Kingdom. Our next stage is a brand new Zelda one, Great Plateau Tower, based on The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild. The Great Plateau is the beginning region of Breath of the Wild, where essentially the tutorial for the game takes place. Part of this opening section sees Link using his Sheikah Slate to activate a Sheikah Tower, the very tower that this stage takes place on, down to the Sheikah Slate pedestal just in the background. The stage overlooks the land of Hyrule in the same location that the actual tower in-game does. The Great Plateau is a raised area above the rest of Hyrule, so you have a great vantage point. You can notably see Death Mountain as well as Hyrule Castle, surrounded by Calamity Ganon's dark energy. There are other Sheikah Towers and Shrines also peppered throughout. The spire of the tower can be attacked, and after enough damage, it will completely fall apart. This never really happens in Breath of the Wild, though it may be an extension of the destruction that takes place when the towers initially activate. When the tower is destroyed, a platform will appear in the center in the same style as the tower, which is a concept completely original to Smash. After a while, the tower will then repair itself. The appearance of the new platform and the tower repairing itself seemingly uses the same ancient Sheikah technology that's used throughout Breath of the Wild. Also in the background, the old man can be seen paragliding onto the tower. The old man is a mysterious hermit who tasks Link with completing shrines on the plateau and ultimately reveals himself as the spirit of King Rome, the former king of Hyrule. He then gives Link the paraglider, allowing him to safely leave the plateau and explore the rest of Hyrule. Next up, we have a stage representing a new series, introduced alongside Inkling, Moray Towers. In the first Splatoon game, Moray Towers was one of the possible stages in the multiplayer modes. It also saw a return in Splatoon 2 as one of only two maps at launch that came from the original game. The full multiplayer stage is pretty large overall, naturally to lend itself to Splatoon's type of gameplay, but Smash takes only the section of scaffolding for its use on the stage. At the start of each match, the stage will get covered with two different colors of ink, representing the general gameplay of Splatoon. These are all real possible color combinations in the original game, which I think is a cute touch. Ordinarily, the stage appears during the daytime. However, when these tracks are chosen to play in the background, the stage will instead appear at nighttime. This is the Splatfest version of the stage. Splatfests are recurring events in the Splatoon series that feature a theme for players to pick a side of, such as dogs versus cats or SpongeBob versus Patrick. The players on each team compete throughout the Splatfest, and the team with the better overall performance is declared that Splatfest winner. The Multiplayer stages are all locked to nighttime during Splatfest, which is why this version of the stage is seen at night. The Splatfest variant also mixes up the possible color combinations a tiny bit, using real colors from actual Splatfest in both Splatoon and Splatoon 2. Both Judd and Lil Judd can be seen on this stage, usually snoozing away, but also dancing during Splatfest and jumping up when a player is KO'd. With one minute remaining or a player on their final stock, they'll wake up and hold up flags to indicate the winning players, waiting to declare the final winner. This function is taken from the actual series, with Judd holding up the winning team's flag in Splatoon 1 and being joined by Lil Judd for the same role in Splatoon 2. Lastly, when most tracks are being played, Now or Never will begin playing with 30 seconds left in the match. Now or Never plays in the Splatoon series in the final minute of a multiplayer match. Since Smash changes this to be 30 seconds, the versions of Now or Never found in the game have been remixed slightly to be more fitting. Now let's talk about Dracula's Castle, the companion stage for Simon and Richter. Dracula's Castle is a regular point of interest in the Castlevania series, with the castle often being the final destination of the main character's adventure and where they obviously fight Dracula. Typically, the path up to Dracula features a long staircase that leads to a hallway that ultimately leads to Dracula's chamber. In Smash, this is reduced to simply be the stairway and chamber, as including the hallway would make this a very long stage. There's also usually stained glass in the chamber, which Smash also includes in its portrayal. In the Castlevania series, Dracula's castle is regularly destroyed destroyed, so Smash takes this idea and uses it on the stage, making it much more conducive for a Smash battle. In the background, a giant clock tower can be seen, another recurring element in the Castlevania series. When items are turned on, candles will occasionally spawn. When attacked, these candles will drop items, a nod to this same mechanic found in Castlevania. In the background of the stage, Dracula's coffin can also be seen, which is another staple set 
piece in Dracula's Chamber. While mechanically this stage doesn't have a ton going on, its big feature is the number of background characters that appear. Over the course of a battle, multiple enemies and characters from the wider Castlevania series will show up in the background, though none of them will impact gameplay in any way. First is the pairing of the Creature and Flea Man, also known as Frankenstein's Monster and Igor. These two first appeared in the first Castlevania as a 2-in-1 boss fight. Next we have a mummy, another type of boss first introduced in the first Castlevania. The Medusa Head, an enemy that tries to ram the player, again from the first Castlevania. A werewolf, a more common enemy that first appeared in Castlevania 2 Simon's Quest. Carmilla, also known as Vampyra. In most iterations, she appears with an actual body, however her portrayal in Smash is based on her giant mask form as it appears in Castlevania II Simon's Quest. And finally, Death, Dracula's second-in-command, first appearing in the first Castlevania as the final obstacle before the player can take on Dracula himself. And speaking of Dracula himself, while he doesn't physically appear on this stage during standard versus mode, his silhouette can appear when lightning strikes randomly throughout the match. Along with his typical appearance, the silhouette of Kid Dracula can also appear when lightning strikes, the appearance that Dracula takes on in the spin-off parody titled Kid Dracula. And that does it for all of the stages that were included in Smash Ultimate's base game. Four brand new stages, plus small battlefield later on. And so, all that we have left is to discuss the DLC stages, each of which was bundled alongside a DLC fighter. The first DLC stage is Mementos, bundled alongside Joker from Persona 5. In Persona 5, Mementos is the palace for everyone's hearts and the core of the metaverse, which itself is a physical manifestation of the collective unconscious. Mementos manifest in the form of a Tokyo subway system, featuring trains and train tracks. While completely optional, Mementos serves as a great resource for grinding experience, money, and personas. In Smash, Mementos uses the train elements in its portrayal of the stage. However, it also takes beats from art done in Mementos, as well as the general design aesthetic for all of Persona 5. Fighters also splash up pink liquid with every step, which is an element taken straight from the original game. The stage has a decent degree of randomness implemented. There are two static platforms, but occasionally a third will appear. A giant wall or ceiling can appear along the sides or top, blocking that section and causing fighters to bounce off if they're hit in that direction. A subway train can also speed by at the bottom, dealing damage to any players that make contact with it. All of this is likely based on the Mementos layout being randomly generated in Persona 5, and it adds to the confusing nature of the metaverse as a whole. Multiple background characters also appear on this stage, all members of the Phantom Thieves of Hearts. First and foremost is the Morgana Mobile. Morgana is a talking cat character, however in the metaverse he has the ability to transform into a bus, which the other Phantom Thieves ride in to traverse through mementos. The Morgana Mobile will drop off multiple other Phantom Thieves who will stand in the background and cheer on the fight. Ryuji, codenamed Skull, An, codenamed Panther, Yusuke, codenamed Fox, Makoto, codenamed Queen, and Haru, codenamed Noir. The final quirk of Mementos has to do with the music. Depending on the track playing, and which game that track originates from, the color scheme of the stage will change up. Songs from Persona 5 naturally feature stars in a red, black, and white scheme. Songs originating from Persona 4 will instead match that game's theme, using yellow instead of red, with flowers. Songs from Persona 3 make the stage blue with green accents and include clocks in the main platform. The background also includes the moon, all emphasizing the dark hour mechanic of Persona 3. The second DLC stage was bundled alongside Hero, Yggdrasil's Altar. Yggdrasil is the name of the world tree in Norse mythology, and in Dragon Quest, this tree floats above the land, said to pierce the heavens as well as provide incredible healing abilities. Multiple games in the series feature Yggdrasil in some way, from simply being a location to serving a bigger role in the overall plot of the game. While Yggdrasil makes regular appearances in the series, the design of Yggdrasil's altar in Smash comes from the design and events that take place in Dragon Quest XI, Echoes of an Elusive Age. In this game, the hero and the party collect the six orbs, which together are the key to unlocking the path to the World Tree herself. The Luminary was to be bestowed the Sword of Light at the heart of the World Tree, but then a bunch of stuff happens that I don't really want to spoil. Go play Dragon Quest XI, it's amazing. The stage doesn't actually focus on these spoilery parts anyway, so we're good there. The stage features a giant flying platform that travels all over the land of Erdrea, the setting of Dragon Quest XI. The platform that flies around is the actual altar, with the six orbs sitting in their respective pedestals. In the actual game, when the six orbs are placed in the pedestals, a rainbow bridge appears that the party physically walks on to access Yggdrasil. This doesn't exactly make for an interesting stage though, so instead, Smash has the altar fly in the air along the rainbow path. Occasionally, additional Smash original platforms will appear on the sides as well. With items on, 
these platforms will contain treasure chests. When attacked, these chests will spawn an item. However, these can also turn out to be mimics, monsters that appear to be chests who will attack the unsuspecting player. Overall, the mechanics of the stage are pretty simple, but there are a fair few background elements that can be seen. Outside of the general land of Erdrea, the world tree can of course be seen from nearly anywhere on the stage. Slimes also had to make an appearance here, bouncing around in the background. Slimes are a low-level enemy that have been in every Dragon Quest game and at this point serve as the mascot for the series. Liquid Metal Slimes can also be potentially seen, though very rarely. Liquid Metal Slimes are rare variations of slimes that have been a staple since Dragon Quest II. If defeated, they result in a ton of experience, making them one of the targets when grinding levels in Dragon Quest. Its rarity in Smash is naturally based on its rarity in the actual games. Tockles can also be seen throughout the stage, just walking around seemingly minding their business. Tockles are a race of creatures newly introduced in Dragon Quest XI. They live in Tickington, a village that exists outside of time. Tockles enlist the Luminary to assist in correcting errors that have taken place throughout time. In Dragon Quest XI, this results in the Luminary assisting in events that take place in the other Dragon Quest games. Some Tockles can be spoken to in the game, but many are seen and then quickly disappear when approached, behaving similarly to the Tockles found on this stage. Finally, the most obvious background character is the gigantic flying whale Cetacea. Cetacea can be summoned by the Luminary using the Calamus Flute in order to fly around Erdrea and access areas that would otherwise be inaccessible such as Havens Above, which we can also conveniently see in the background of this stage as well. Alright, you guys know I have been itching to talk about this one, our third DLC stage bundled with Banjo and Kazooie, Spiral Mountain. Spiral Mountain is the first area of Banjo-Kazooie, very aptly named because it has a spirally mountain directly in the center. There are multiple sections to Spiral Mountain, from a rocky area to a waterfall to literally Banjo's house. The area really serves as the tutorial sandbox, with Bottles the Mole teaching you each of your starter moves and each section serving a function to master that move. The actual spiral mountain in the center also has a rope bridge that leads to Gruntilda's lair, which kind of makes you wonder why Banjo would choose to live right next door. In Banjo-Tooie, Grunty's Revenge, and Nuts and Bolts, Spiral Mountain has an even briefer appearance, usually serving as an opening area that you then quickly leave. However, much of the design of the stage in Smash is a sort of combination between elements of the original Banjo-Kazooie as well as Nuts and Bolts. The actual battle takes place at the top of Spiral Mountain, the center of the area. Smash gets creative here and the camera will rotate around the mountain, keeping the characters oriented towards the player and shifting around obstacles and surfaces to better suit the battle. This is a Smash original feature largely made to make the stage more interesting, but it also helps show off the entirety of Spiral Mountain rather than just one specific section. There are multiple background cameos on this stage as well. First, we have the previously mentioned Bottles the Mole. In Banjo-Kazooie, Bottles teaches Banjo and Kazooie about different abilities over the course of their adventure. Next is Mumbo Jumbo, a magical shaman. In Banjo-Kazooie, Mumbo will transform Banjo and Kazooie into a bunch of different forms in exchange for Mumbo tokens. He'll also juggle his eyes in the background, which is one of his possible idol animations from Nuts and Bolts. Next we have the Jinjos. These are a race of creatures that were kidnapped by Gruntilda and left abandoned in the different worlds. In the first game, there are five Jinjos in each world, totaling five different colors. In Smash, Jinjos can appear in groups of as little as one and as many as five at a time, or anywhere in between. Gruntilda Winky Bunyan herself also appears in the background of the stage. Grunty is of course the main antagonist throughout the entire series. She initially kidnaps Banjo's sister, Tootie, to steal her beauty, but after the first game, she just continually has beef with the Baron Bird for defeating her. Grunty will fly around on her broomstick and do her iconic laugh in the background. The final character to make an appearance is Tootie. She's a bit harder to see, appearing down on the ground level of Spiral Mountain rather than being directly visible. She runs around Spiral Mountain, making infinite loops around the area, and occasionally occasionally being seen if the angle allows. Her running in Spiral Mountain is likely a nod to her running in the intro of Banjo-Kazooie. A common enemy can also be seen here, Buzz Bombs. These enemies were chosen because their ability to fly made them fit quite naturally in the high up background of Spiral Mountain. Ironically, these enemies never actually appear in Spiral Mountain. Extra Honeycombs, which increase Banjo and Kazooie's health, and 1-Up Trophies, which obviously increase total life count, can also be seen in the background in nearly the exact same places as they appear in the real Spiral Mountain in Kazooie, which I think is a nice touch. Moving on to the fourth DLC pack, Terry Bogard was bundled alongside King of Fighters Stadium. 
Now, this stage design-wise is pretty unique because it really seems to be a Smash original concept. Maybe inspired by bits and pieces throughout the Fatal Fury and King of Fighters series, but overall nothing is one-to-one. -one. King of Fighters started out as a Fatal Fury game where a tournament literally titled King of Fighters was taking place before it would turn into its own standalone series. So this stage seemingly taking place in front of a gigantic audience is based on the in-universe King of Fighters tournament. The full stage takes place inside of a football stadium, complete with a giant King of Fighter sign with a Jumbotron beneath it. The football field has the Smash logo in the center, with the letters KOF inside of it. The actual fighting takes place on a raised platform at the end of the field. This area has two invisible walls that run along the left and right sides. At lower levels of knockback, fighters will just bounce off of these walls. However, at high knockback, they will instead shatter through the walls, resulting in a KO. This mechanic has multiple layers to its origin. Traditional fighting games have always featured an invisible wall of sorts. The actual play area of a stage only goes so far, so even if the design of the stage seems to extend further, characters will still bounce against that invisible wall. However, the way this is implemented in Smash is taken from one specific game in the Fatal Fury series, Real Bout Fatal Fury. These invisible walls still exist, however if a player is knocked against them enough times, this barrier will be destroyed, and a Smash style ring out can occur. However, Smash keeps these walls up permanently and determines the breakthrough based on knockback. Real Bout Fatal Fury, on the other hand, destroys these walls permanently for the duration of the match. Because King of Fighters is ultimately a giant SNK crossover series, this stage takes that concept and absolutely runs with it, including many, and I mean many, background characters. Andy Bogard, Joe Higashi, Geese Howard, Billy Kane, Rock Howard, Tung Fu Rei, Kim Kafwan, Blue Mary, Ryuji Yamazaki, Ryo Sakazaki, Yuri Sakazaki, King, Kyo Kusanagi, Iori Yagami, Goro Daimon, Chang Koehan, Choi Bounge, Athena Asamiya, Ralph Jones, and Clark Still. This makes for a grand total of 20 background characters for this stage, which is insane. But it also does a really good job of expressing the crossover nature of the King of Fighters series. They really could have half-assed it, but they didn't, and that's awesome, I respect it. The final DLC stage from Fighter Pass 1 came with Byleth, the Garrig Mach Monastery. This location serves as the setting for Fire Emblem Three Houses. It contains the Officer Academy, where Byleth is hired on as a professor, and it also has a cathedral for the Church of Seros. There are also smaller areas found throughout the monastery, many of which are explored in the Smash stage. Similar to a previous Fire Emblem stage, Castle Siege, this stage features multiple static locations that are visited throughout the course of a match. A platform will rise up from the ground at one location and carry fighters to the next, and so on. The stage always starts out on the marketplace, at the foot of a large set of stairs. In three houses, this is where buying and selling of weapons and gear takes place. In the background of this section, Dimitri, Dadu, and Ingrid can be seen. All three of these are members of the Blue Lion House, one of the three houses of Officer's Academy, led by Dimitri. Additionally, at the entrance to the monastery, the gatekeeper can be seen. While in the game he's a fairly unimportant character, he became such an incredibly popular meme among the Fire Emblem community that I'm convinced that is the sole reason he was included in the stage. The next location the stage visits is the reception hall. Here, members of the school gather for events, such as the White Heron Cup and the Ethereal Moon Ball. In the background, the Black Eagle House is represented, with Dorothea, Petra, and the leader Edelgard watching on the sidelines. The third location is the bridge, which connects the cathedral to the rest of the monastery. Here, the background characters are from the third house of the academy, the Golden Deer House. Claude, the leader, Hilda, and Lorenz. A Pegasus Knight is also included in the background, referencing the recurring unit in Fire Emblem games that's been seen in the series since the very first entry. The final phase of this stage is the inside of the cathedral itself. Here, members of the Church of Saros watch the fight, Ray, Flame, and Sedef. This completes the loop, and the stage returns to the marketplace to start it all over again. Moving into Fighter Pass 2, the first new stage, bundled alongside Min Min, is Spring Stadium. This stage is of course inspired by an actual stage in ARMS, though ironically, Spring Stadium is the home stage of Spring Man, not Min Min. Spring Stadium is a medium-sized arena that has trampolines along the edges, giving players the opportunity to jump high in the air if they use it. The stage in Smash is fairly faithful to the design of Spring Stadium in ARMS, with the exception that it takes place over a giant pit and the number of trampolines are reduced. These trampolines are not always active. For some of the fight, they will simply be standard ground. 
However, they will flash green and slightly raise, indicating that they are now in, quote, trampoline mode. If a player jumps while standing on this section, they will blast into the air and have their body actually serve as a minor hitbox, capable of hitting other players. With items on, ARMS drones will occasionally fly by with items. This same thing happens in the actual ARMS game, where ARMS drones can fly by with either healing or damaging items. Finally, the background features adoring fans, wearing Smash Bros. logo shirts of either Springman's or Min Min's main color. The second stage added in Fighter Pass 2 came with Steve and Alex, Minecraft World. In Minecraft, each new world is generated based off of a random seed, so that each world is generated at the point of creation and is completely randomized. You can, of course, enter a specific seed to get to a specific world, but for all intents and purposes, each world is completely unique. However, the elements and consistencies in Minecraft is where Smash takes inspiration. Throughout a Minecraft world, players can find many different types of biomes, regions of the land that have different characteristics, such as desert, canyon, or snow-filled areas. These biomes impact gameplay by spawning different mobs and offering different resources, with the additional perk of keeping gameplay fresh so that you aren't staring at the same thing for dozens of hours. Minecraft World in Smash Ultimate takes the idea of biomes and runs with it, providing six different variations of the stage, each representing different biomes that can be found in Minecraft. The first form is the Plains Biome, one of the most common biomes in Minecraft. The background features two houses, a well, some crops, and villagers. This represents villages that can be found in the Plains Biome, naturally spawning areas with non-playable characters that serve a variety of functions. Villages are typically much bigger, but this needed to conform to the size of the stage, so it's been reduced a bit. Second is the Birch Forest Biome, obviously featuring birch trees. There's not much more to say about this one. Third, the Savannah Biome. This biome features acacia trees and browning grass, and has a hidden platform inside of the foreground tree. Fourth, the Taiga Biome. This features spruce trees and a mossy stone structure. In the background, a footpath can be seen leading to another villager house. Fifth is the snowy tundra biome, naturally featuring snow. An igloo sits smack in the center of the fighting area, and a villager house and set of lanterns can be seen in the background, along with another villager. Finally, the Stony Shore. While this isn't necessarily a full biome, this one represents the concept of exploring and mining in caves, something that otherwise wouldn't have been represented in the Smash stage. Stony Shores are usually found in areas where mountains meet large bodies of water, which makes the background of this form make a lot of sense. Along with all of these variations, each form features a day-night cycle. It will start out at daytime, with villagers and animals walking around in the background. When nighttime falls, villagers return to the safety of their homes and the hostile mobs will spawn. Zombies, Endermen, Skeletons, or Spiders. In Minecraft, players need to strategically play around nighttime by either sleeping, lighting an area with torches, or being brave and fighting. Villagers hiding inside their homes is an exact parallel to their behavior in Minecraft at nighttime. Most of the blocks in the foreground of the stage are either destroyable or, in the case of Steve, mineable for resources. Once these blocks are destroyed, they will never return for the rest of the match, leaving the fight to the core stage and whatever platforms exist on the form. For the purposes of Steve's mining, the mineable sections of the main platform are always in the same order, allowing for some consistency. The background of each variant is a screenshot taken from a biome of a real Minecraft world. Interestingly, people have been on the hunt since the reveal of Steve to find the seeds for each of these background images so that you could feasibly play in the worlds in the actual Minecraft game. While claims have been made about discovered seeds, I wasn't able to track any of them down, so either those seeds have actually been discovered and unreleased, or people just be lying. The original concept for this stage was that players would be able to create their own stages in Minecraft and then transfer them over to be played in Smash Ultimate. However, in Sakurai's own words, this idea was impossible. Next up, Northern Cave, bundled with Sephiroth. Northern Cave is the final dungeon in Final Fantasy VII, connected to the planet's core and where the final battle against Sephiroth takes place. The stage loosely follows the beats of the ending of Final Fantasy VII. Sephiroth summons Meteor, a massive asteroid, with the intent to destroy all life on the planet. Cloud and the rest of the party fly into the Northern Cave on the airship named Highwind, which is visible in the background at certain points of the stage. After entering the actual cave, the background pauses on a glowing green orb, which is the holy spell that Aerith cast being held back by Sephiroth. After Sephiroth's defeat, Holy gets released in a huge burst, and the party escapes the area via the Highwind. The background then shows Meteor plummeting to the ground but then being stopped by the Now Unleashed Holy and the lifestream of the planet. The background then fades out, mimicking the actual game's original ambiguous ending, 
and the loop begins again. In Smash, Meteor drops at the location of the Northern Cave, however in the original game, it actually drops over Midgar. While the actual events come from Final Fantasy VII, a couple of elements are borrowed from Square Enix's own fighting game, Dissidia Final Fantasy. Northern Cave appears in this game under the name Planet's Core. The stage and platform designs in Smash are taken from the arena in Planet's Core, and the green speeding background also appears at one point as well. The fourth stage introduced in Fighters Pass 2 is the Cloud Sea of Allrest, bundled with Pyra and Mithra from Xenoblade Chronicles 2. The stage takes place atop the back of Azurda, a small titan that acts as a combination of Rex's guardian, transport, and home. Rex affectionately calls him Gramps. This form that Gramps takes on is found pretty early in Xenoblade 2, as Gramps reverts back to his larval state during the course of the story and instead rides inside of Rex's helmet. As a stage, this one is pretty simple. Gramps continually flies through the air above the clouds of Allrest, the world found in Xenoblade Chronicles 2. Occasionally, he'll turn his head, angling the end of the stage and making it a bit shorter for a while. He'll also make different remarks at various points throughout the match, such as when a player is KO'd, when Pyra or Mithra are being played, or just completely at random. Over the course of the match, other titans will appear in the background. Each of these titans are explorable areas from Xenoblade Chronicles 2. Goldmouth, with Maelstrom in tow, Gormot, Uriah, Mor Ardane, Genbu, and Indol. Along with these background cameos, several of Rex's allies from the events of the game will hang out in the background of the battle. There are four possible sets of two, a driver and blade that can appear. Nia, with her blade Dromark, Tora the Nopon, along with his artificial blade, Poppy Alpha, Morag paired with Brigid, and finally Zeke with his blade, Pandoria. The penultimate stage added to the game is Mishima Dojo, bundled along with Kazuya. As you can guess, this one is really straightforward. It's just a dojo opened by the Mishima family in order to teach students martial arts. The core design of this stage is based on the appearance of the Mishima Dojo as it appears in the arcade version of Tekken 7. However, that stage is itself a recreation of the Pagoda Temple from Tekken 2. The walls and ceilings on this stage are capable of being destroyed by player attacks or players being blasted into them. The dojo's appearance in the console port of Tekken 7 features it partially destroyed after the fight between Heiachi and Street Fighter's Akuma. So while it starts out looking like the arcade version, the destroyable sections equally make it look like the console version. On top of this, the Tekken series does have a similar mechanic known as wall breaks. Certain stages in Tekken 4, 6, and 7 could have elements destroyed during gameplay. However, Mishima Dojo was never one of these, so liberties were obviously taken to improve the Smash experience and pay tribute to Tekken 7's story. Heiachi Mishima appears in the background of the stage. He'll initially start by sitting away from the battle, staring at the Fudo Miyo'o statue in the background, a prominent symbol in certain schools of Buddhism. But eventually, he'll react to the destruction around him and KOs by standing up and facing the action. Heiachi's father founded the dojo, and Heiachi himself learned the martial arts there, likely teaching his son Kazuya there as well. The center of the stage features a Dharma wheel, an important symbol in multiple Eastern religions. Inside of the Dharma wheel are the 12 animals of the Chinese zodiac, and inside of that, a painting of a tiger fighting a phoenix. The final small detail is found on the floor of the stage. The names of Heiachi and his wife Kazumi are carved into the wood beneath an umbrella. Sharing an umbrella is seen as a romantic symbol in Japan, and writing two names beneath an umbrella is sort of the equivalent of drawing a heart around a pair of initials in the West. This detail can be seen in Tekken 7's version of Mishima Dojo, carried over from the original Pagoda Temple stage during a time when Kazumi's existence was only ever hinted at. And now, the final stage ever added to Smash Ultimate, Hollow Bastion, bundled alongside Sora. Now, Kingdom Hearts is famously a convoluted mess of a story, so I'm not going to dive into the entire history of this location. The short and sweet version is, there was once a world named Radiant Garden, a land that was explored and central to the plot of Kingdom Hearts Birth by Sleep. This land was eventually taken over by evil, turning it into the Land of Darkness with the new name of Hollow Bastion, first visited in Kingdom Hearts 1. Later on in the series, the town is restored back into a livable region, returning it to the original name of Radiant Garden. This location has made an appearance in over half a dozen Kingdom Hearts games. However, the version that appears as the stage in Smash is quite specifically the very first appearance of the location as it appears in Kingdom Hearts 1. The stage begins at the Rising Falls, where Sora, Donald, and Goofy land on their first arrival. Eventually, the stage rises high to show the exterior of Hollow Bastion, a giant convoluted, haphazardly designed castle. The actual castle features a pretty incredible amount of detail that will often go unnoticed in the heat of a battle, so I just wanted to briefly show some of the more impressive 
impressive parts here. The main stage features similar design elements as the actual stage, from the rusted and broken pipes to the stained glass. It also has a symbol that matches the bigger one on the actual castle, the symbol for the Heartless, the primary enemy found in Kingdom Hearts 1 and the series overall. But this stage has a secondary form that only activates when time, stocks, or health are running low. Dive to the Heart Dive to the Heart is a more abstract idea in the Kingdom Hearts series. Characters enter a dreamlike world where giant stained glass pillars, called stations, exist. Most of the time, this serves as a character's tutorial where they learn combat, controls, and pick their stats. Sometimes it also serves as the setting for a fight. Stations all have unique stained glass floors, depicting the played character and elements associated with them. They occasionally also show off other Disney characters or locations. When Hollow Bastion transforms into Dive to the Heart, there are seven possible possible forms that the stage can take on, each one based off of a different Kingdom Hearts character's personalized dive to the heart, featuring characters and elements relevant to their stories. Sora and the Kingdom Key Keyblade, featuring Kairi, Riku, a Palpu Fruit, and the Highwind Ship. The bottom portion represents Destiny Islands, Sora's home world. Riku, with his original Soul Eater Keyblade, featuring Sora, Namine, and Ansem's Seeker of Darkness. This is bordered by a silhouette of cards as they appear in Chain of Memories. The bottom represents the Realm of Darkness, representing Riku being trapped in this realm at the end of Kingdom Hearts 1. Roxas, also with the Kingdom Key, featuring Axel, Shion, and Riku. The border contains the symbol for the Nobodies, a group that Roxas is a part of. The background features Twilight Town's Clock Tower, an important location to Roxas' story. Shion, featuring Axel, Saex, Xemnas, and Sora. As Shion is herself a nobody, the border likewise has the nobody symbol. The bottom portion also features where nothing gathers, a meeting room for Organization 13. Terra, with his Keyblade, featuring Ventus, Aqua, and the Wayfinder charms the three of them have as a sort of friendship charm. The border contains both the Wayfinder and Terra's own symbol, and the background is a basic checker pattern containing the series heart and crown logos, as well as the symbol for the Unversed, the main enemy in Terra's game. Ventus with his Keyblade. Instead of having characters this time, he only has the Wayfinder symbols, likely representing that his soul was lost during the events of the series, and that he really just wants to be back with his friends. His border also has Terra's symbol, and the background depicts the Keyblade graveyard, alluding to the events at the end of Birth by Sleep. Finally, Aqua with her Keyblade, featuring Ventus, Terra, Vanitas, and Master Xehanort. The border has the Wayfinder symbol, and the background is the same as Terra's, with the heart, crown, and unverse symbol. In the actual Kingdom Hearts series, there are plenty of Disney elements that exist in these station panels. For Sora, the Paupu Fruit and the High Wind were originally Donald and Goofy. In Riku's, King Mickey in the organization robe is replaced by Sora. Terra's and Aqua's had Mickey symbols that were removed. However, this Disney removal was actually not completely original to Smash. Most of the Dive to the Heart panels received modifications for the game's 15th anniversary event. At Square Enix cafes, coasters were available that used various Dive to Heart panels in their designs. This is where a majority of the Disney removal scene in Smash actually originates, as seen most notably in Sora and Riku's removal of Donald, Goofy, and Mickey. Smash had other minor adjustments though, such as removing Mickey symbols in favor of other Kingdom Hearts symbols. This is most likely to avoid licensing conflicts with Disney, ultimately keeping everything in Smash focused on the Square Enix original content, which legally is probably much easier to maneuver. And with that, we are done. Every stage in every Smash game representing dozens of franchises with hundreds of references. I hope that looking at all of these stage you learned something new, and I'd love to know down in the comments what your favorite stage in all of Smash is. Thank you all so much for watching, I hope you enjoyed this. I will see you guys in the next video. Peace out, and please remember to be good to one another.